بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Society Nothing But Facts live stream on a cold all of a sudden day in the great state of New Jersey. It's sunny, but for some reason it is cold again. I don't know why it's cold, but... Huh? Yeah, maybe just in here, but... Uh, we got a couple segments today. The first thing I want to talk about is Sean King entering Islam and then getting slammed by a lot of people who have issues with him from before he entered Islam. And apparently those issues have to do with uh, two fundraising um, campaigns that he ran in which people felt strongly enough to accuse him of taking the funds. It's a big accusation. And and that he fundraises too much. Well, here's the thing with that. You either have proof that the man stole or you don't. That's how I look at it. That's number one. But number two, what does that have to do with the guy being a Muslim? Let's hypothetically say he stole, right? Thieves don't have beliefs. Let's take it to the worst possible scenario, right? An absolute thief enters Islam. You don't think thieves actually think about God and maybe do have beliefs? Oh, it's another grift of his. Really? This is not a good grift. (laughs) You're not a good grifter if if becoming a Muslim is part of your deal. There is not a lot of paychecks going on. Being a Zionist is far better, right? Think about that. The grifter, I mean, he was already a, a, what is it? Before that, he was one of these... uh, Baptists, okay? This is not a smart grift. It's not a smart move if it's a grift. Secondly, wouldn't he want to publicize it? Because last I checked, he didn't. The masjid did. The uh, East Plano Mosque had their live stream going, and most masjid, they just got a camera sitting there. Anytime there's uh, an event going on, if the imam sneezes, they turn the camera on, right? Anytime a guest comes in, they turn this live stream on. I've seen this in small time message where they've set it up that there's a camera sitting there hooked up to the computer, to their YouTube page or whatever page. And the moment uh, an event starts, it's a click a button. That's it. And then, uh, so it happens to be streamed, right? So my question is though, there is number one to attack this or to question the sincerity of a Muslim you may have your own personal beliefs, but you keep it to yourself because it's nothing other than a personal speculation. What's the proof of that? The proof of that is that Osama bin Zaid came upon a man in a battle, and this man, he got him, basically, he's about to kill him. And he ended up, the man said, Okay, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Ah, this is fake. Killed him, right? That's what what happened with the the great companion Osama bin Zaid who was the son of Zaid bin Haritha who was at one point Zaid bin Muhammad he had was adopted by the prophet peace be upon him it's number 1 so Zaid bin uh, Osama bin Zaid killed him he said this man it's a fake shahada he's just trying to save his life okay and then word spread to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said, oh, Osama, what happened? He said this, this, and this. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Ashaqaqta an sadrihi. Did you open his heart to look at what's inside? Ashaqaqta an sadrihi, ashaqaqta an qalbihi. To see what's inside. So if that's the case for a man who was obviously saving his life, so it's to us, obviously to us, but are we allowed to act upon it? The answer is no. Because we have a law, people. We have a law. We act upon the law. The law treats you by what you can prove. It treats you by the outward. I can't prove anything is on the inside or not on the inside. So if that's the case with Osama bin Zaid and that companion and that man who uttered the shahad and then was killed and the prophet peace be upon him said did you open his heart then it's far more worthy to say it about this man 
who was not fighting the Muslims, was not fighting for his life, and is making a decision that will really make it his economic life much harder. His financial life much harder. We don't have multi-million people speaking to us. Go around, ask around. We don't have multi-million dollar or institutions that are given 15000 2000 I mean, $20,000, $30,000 gigs to talk. And that's not even a lot of money in today's day and age. In a regular institution, if a celebrity could get 50K just to show up and talk for 20 minutes. So point being, in our law by Islam, we're not allowed to say he's a fraud in his shahada. He's a fake in his shahada. You want to say, I don't like the way he does business. I don't like his personality. Fine, say that all you want. But you cannot now doubt someone's shahada. That's not allowed in Islam. Simple as that. Now, let me talk about something else. Why don't we let people prove themselves? And by the way, they don't have to prove anything to us. They don't owe a zilch to us. When you become Muslim, if you're out there and you're thinking about becoming a Muslim, you don't owe the community zilch. You, you don't have to prove yourself. This is actually promotes hypocrisy when people act like this. I'll prove your, you know, it promotes hypocrisy. And the whole woke world, it's all a bunch of hypocrites. Okay? I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. They constantly want you to prove that you're not racist. Prove that you're not something else, right? Prove you're, that you're not uh, against women. Prove that you're all about diversity. So what does this promote? It's resulted in a bunch of fakes. A bunch of people who are just, it's what they call performative. It's a performance. Just to make sure that, you know, nobody calls me this, that, or the other. Right? That's all, that's what it's become. So when you're, you become a community where someone has to prove themselves to you? No. I'll tell you who has to prove themselves to you. Anytime that you and that person are going to have some kind of share a risk. Like what? You want to marry into my family? Well, you're guilty until proven innocent. No, no, it's not your right to marry somebody. It's not a, a right that you have. And it's not your right upon me that I have to accept you. You need to prove yourself. If I have to hire you, I have a job. And I want to hire you. It's not your right to take this job. It's not my my right to give you money. It's not zakah. It's my it's my company. It's my store or whatever. So when there's a job, when there's, for example, uh, hey, you have room in your apartment? Yes, I do. Oh, good. I need an apartment. You want to split rent? I don't have to split rent with you. It's not charity. This is not zakah. I have to see who you are first. So there are certain things in Islam that the, it's fair for us to say, you better prove yourself. You understand? But at their actual faith, listen, if you want to donate to his charity, interrogate him all you want. If it's about marrying him, interrogate him all you want. If it's about hiring him, interrogate him all you want. But when someone takes a shahada, you're not allowed to say he's a liar and it's a grift. Isn't that fair and simple too? It's very fair, I think, and it's very simple. And let me go back to the point. Let us hypothetically say that a guy, the guy is a complete thief. Okay? Don't thieves also have like religious proclivities at some point? Can a th Don't we have the hadith of the 90, the guy killed 99 people. Then he goes and asks a worshiper, is there any forgiveness for me? I killed 99 people. That worshiper was ignorant. He was pious, but ignorant. He said, 99? How do you kill 99 people? Right? And so he killed that guy. Boom, 100 people he killed. So, I mean, the man is trying to make repentance after killing 100 people. Murder of 100 people. A scholar said, yes, repentance. He, came, he went to a scholar. He did the right thing. He went to a scholar. He said, yes, 100 people. You can still make Toba, even if he killed 100 people. So he then went 
uh, he said, you need to go move to another city because this, the people of this city, they're no good. Why are they no good? They're no good for a couple reasons. Number one, you killed 99 people and no one established a head punishment on you, right? Th these people are definitely no good. You killed 100 people. No one advised you. Nobody stopped you physically. No good, right? So uh, these people are no good. So move to this other city where the people are good. So he did move to that city, and but on the way there, he died. When he died, uh, the angel of hell came to take him, and the angel of mercy came to take him. And then they argued, is this man to hell or to heaven? So then they had to ha get an arbitrator. So a third angel came to arbitrate between them. I don't know if it was Jibreel or somebody else from the Malaika. The angel came to arbitrate between them and said, okay, why don't we measure the distance? That's the fair arbitration. If he had made it to the new city, all right, halfway to the new city, then yes, go goes to heaven. His tobe is accepted. If he makes it to, if he didn't, then no, take him to hell because he didn't fulfill his repentance. So they measured and they found he was short. He didn't make it to the halfway point. Okay. But then Allah caused an earthquake to occur. And when the earthquake occurred, then he had made the distance. And he was taken to paradise. Okay. This man killed 100 people. No one questioned his repentance. No excuse uh, on this one. It's pretty cut and dry. Don't, don't, uh... You don't like his charity? Don't don't eat his charity. You don't like his talks? Don't listen to his talks. Same, I have the, it's the same exact thing I said about Andrew Tate. You don't like him to listen to him, but to question if someone is a Muslim is not, is not allowed for us to do. You want to say uh, he's a hypocrite of actions? So, yeah, fine. Say what you want. Hypocrite of actions is that we don't we we're not saying that you're a liar in your heart. We're saying that your actions don't match your behavior, your 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 words. Say what you want. You want to say he's a fasc? Say what you want. I, uh, you know what I say about Andrew Tate? I actually, I, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't disbelieve that he's. Same thing with Sean King. I, I take it further at, at at his face value that he converted to Islam. When I listen to his podcast with Muhammad Hijab, I liked a lot of things that he says. I, I do like a lot of things that he says, and there's a ton of stuff that's total garbage, right? And let me tell you this. But here's my biggest critique of him, and it's just a critique of like his philosophy or whatever his movement he's doing, right? Brother, you don't go home to take care of a wife, kids. You don't take care of anybody. You go home. Yes, I know you're like under house arrest, but even before that, you go home and you buy Bugattis and you buy cars and you do all these other things, smoke cigar, hang out with the boys and play poker. What are you talking about manhood? You had not put, showed in your life one thing of manhood. Kickboxing? Okay, fine. But manhood is not to go hang out with your boys, smoke cigar and stream, and then, of course, you're working out so well, right? Because you got all the time in the world. If I had that amount of time, I could work out as, as better than you. Yeah, scattered all over the world with all different women. A good dad, are you... Do you raise them every day? Do you wake them up for school? Do you wake them up for so, for whatever it is? Do you take, drive them? Good dad is the guy who does the absolute most te uh, tedious things with their kids. That is what I would call a good dad. The guy who goes, drives the kid to practice, waits there in the car, okay? Make me takes his laptop with him, then goes, takes him back. Hey, how's the math all right, let's work on these math questions. Meanwhile, the guy has spent zero time on himself, the man. That is a good dad. Then when he gets home, okay, the kid's done. We're taking care of that. All right, what's next? All right, I got a meeting for this organization I'm a volunteer for. All right, what's next after that? All right, let's go sit down and have a cup of tea, you know, with the wife. It's not, uh, you're not a man when you got all the time in the world for yourself. That's to improve anything. 
and then go to the gym, all right, and then take pictures, and then here's my uh, my my car that you got from uh, basically selling women, essentially. That was the main business that he started. Up. But that was before Islam, so let's not hold him accountable to that. But I'm telling you, I like a lot of things he said, but I'm, I'm telling you this man would think it's all bakwas. It's complete bakwas. You do not take care of anybody on a day-to-day basis. Now, I'm not saying this to trash the guy, because as I said, I actually do like him, right? Generally speaking, uh, uh, but this thing, no, you're not taking care of anybody. You're, you're not representing this thing properly. Most of these things that Allah says, الرجال قوامون على النساء, meaning they are providing these services needed for this woman to live well. And they're taking care, he's taking care of her kids and taking care of a lot of things in the community. Okay, so that they could have a good community life. That is qawam. Constantly, nonstop, standing up. Nonstop, doing stuff. That's the aspiration. That stuff is never going to make it on uh, Instagram and Twitter and, and with that generation of people. Okay, Making money is a sliver of that. It's a very important part of that. There's no doubt about that. Okay, But it's, it's not the main part of it. So, uh, likewise, Owen Benjamin. When he was interested in Islam, I'm interested to talk to him. If he loses his interest in Islam... That's his choice, right? Khalas. Does that so all three of them, all three of them, you can make critiques of them. One, you can say, Oh my gosh, what what he said about blacks is absurd. I agree. Khalas. We are not gonna the way, this is how I view it in Islam. The Prophet said the Muslims are one body. If one part of them in, is injured, right, is hurt, then all of them are awake in fever, which means I'm not Pakistani. I don't know about Pakistani politics, but if there was a civil war in Pakistan, all my friends, it doesn't, it's not, it would not touch my household life, my extended family, my in-laws. It would not touch our life, not 1%. Yet, all my friends are Pakistani. Okay? All the restaurants I go to are Pakistani. Okay? So therefore, they're affected. You think now I'm going to completely ignore it? I have to look into it now as a Muslim brother and feel for them i gotta have some kind of sensitivity to that same thing with african americans same thing with white americans same thing with hispanic americans whatever any of course the whole ummah with philistine 95 percent of the ummah is not even philistine right 80 percent of the ummah is not even arab speaking at least right so that's that is our aqidah that is our approach. So anything that is in generally upsetting to a group of people becomes upsetting to all of us but by religious mandate, right? By religious mandate. So like, oh, do you care about, oh, you tell me there's a, there's a coup d'etat in Costa Rica. I could care less, right? Now you say, oh no, Costa Rica, they're all from the Ummah of Islam. They're all Muslims. All right, now I guess I have to care, right? I'll go look it up and I'll spend a few minutes and I'll ask a Costa Rican brother what's going on here. And then I care. Right. Other than that, I genuinely would not care. How many? How much can I care? There's too much information. So that's the point. So we we denounce from a person what they do that is contradictory to the Quran and the Sunnah and the Sharia, and if they do something good, we accept it. And my role on podcasts on the stream is to just talk to anyone who's interested in Islam. So if I, whether it's Sean King, whether it's uh, other, anyone else. Okay. Segment number two. Are the Muslims going to abandon Biden? Let's talk about this. Let's bring on our guest, Hassan Abdesalam. Welcome to the Safina Society. Nothing but facts live stream. Amazing, amazing. Oh, Omar, can you turn the TV on? Because I can't hear him. The volume. Hold on, I can't hear. Maybe... It's something else. It's uh, so the volume's on. Maybe he's not on. Uh, say something real quick. Assalamualaikum. No, no, he's you he can't hear him. It's not the TV. It's not the TV. It's maybe it's uh, what you call it. It's either uh, Streamyard. 
It's either StreamYard or something else. You guys can hear him, but I can't hear him. Yeah, you guys can hear him, but I can't hear him. In the meantime, speaking of StreamYard, I was asked to come on to StreamYard by another gentleman. His name is Dimashki. What did he say? To come and debate me on StreamYard. <laughs> you know Dimashki? Yeah, I know that guy. You know what? He, he called me a scorpion while we fixed this. I'll just tell you this story. He said, we have a new scorpion in town. Who's the new scorpion? It's me. Why? Because I said, Salafi is a fifth madhab, and we're not following it. So wait a second. Is that from... Kawaid al-Din or something <laughs> that you would get to call. What is the what is the issue here? Min Kawaid al-Din, right? That um, you have to believe in Salafiyah. Subhanallah, Shay Ajib. Something happened when Zabe was was here. Yeah, I've been gone. So let's let's keep working on that. Um, anyway, Hassan, stay with us while we fix it. We'll do the second segment that I wanted to do, which was the mas'ala on niqab. I just answered a question the other day, correctly and accurately in the Maliki school. Uh, what uh, Imam Khalil says, This is from, it's in the book of... Um, preconditions of salah the coverage of a woman and the coverage of a man in prayer and what is discouraged so it is discouraged and i'm going to read to you here that's the text from khalid i'm going to read to you here what ad-dardir says covering her face with niqab okay that which reaches the eye because it is from what is extremism? What is extremes? What is ghulu in sharia? The definition of ghulu is to obligate that which Allah did not obligate. What the sharia didn't obligate. Okay? And you can find that definition in Nafrawi's commentary on a risala. All right? awla, And a man, of course, cannot uh, cover his face. Uh, it's makru. However, if it is... Now, this is inside of salah and outside of salah. The karahia, the discouragement, okay, is inside of salah or outside of salah. Who says that? A uh, dasuqi. He says here, a sawa and kanat fi salatin aw fi ghayriha kan al intiqabu fiha li ajlihi awla. So, awla. So he says, it is makru inside of salah or outside of salah. Why? Because it is ghulu. What is dasuqi? He gives you the same meaning that Nafrawi gives later on, because Nafrawi came later. He says, aziyada fiddin. Okay? So if something all right, is in the religion and you went took it and obligated more than what Allah obligated, that's what we call ghulu. If you brought something completely outside of the deen, completely outside the deen, that's a bid'ah. That's a difference. Okay? So all ghulu is bid'a. But not all bid'a is ghulu. You see, all ghulu is bid'a. Because you're bringing something, you're, going, you're stretching something and making an obligation that is not there in the religion. Okay? Now, there's some commentary though. He says, مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ قَوْمٍ عَادَتُهُمْ ذَلِكْ Meaning, intiqab. If you come upon a people and the way that they dress is to cover their face. فَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمٍ عَادَتُهُمْ ذَلِكْ Okay. And he gives an example, like the people of Nafusa. Okay. And Masuqa in Morocco. فَإِنَّ النِّقَابَ مِنْ دَأْبِهِمْ Niqab is their, their habit. وَمِنْ عَادَتِهِمْ لَا يَتْرُكُونَهُ أَصْلًا فَلَا يُكْرَى they all cover their faces. And also, we have to remember to the Tuareg people, the men cover their faces from the sand. So if covering the face for any reason is just a ada of the qawm, it's a habit of the people, then it's not makru, right? Then you can wear it outside salah, not inside salah. 
okay. هذا كله في غير الصلاة وأما فيها إن الصلاة فيكره it's always مكروه even وإن اعتيد كما okay. uh, تقدم even if it's okay. a habit of the people so inside Salah is different from outside Salah قوله فالنقاب مكروه مطلقا it is مكروه مطلقا كان في الصلاة أو خارجها سواء كان فيها لأجلها أو لغيرها okay. regardless in Salah outside Salah ما لم يكن لعادة as long as it's not the common behavior of that people and that if so then فلا كرها right he goes on to other subjects now. Now, what about if there is fisk and harm? Then that's a separate question. Seturul wajhi makhafat al fitna is a whole nother question. And at that point, there is no one to say generally right away what is the fitna and what is a fasq. That's up for discussion. So there, there is a clar- is it's not a clarification, it's just repeating exactly what I said on that clip that went on to YouTube that surprised many people because they didn't know the Medici school. And now let's ask some other questions. How is it that the wives of the Prophet were niqab? Answer the question is very simple. It's something very specific to them. I think it's fixed now. Lower the volume at least so it doesn't interfere. There you go. Uh, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore niqab. That's a khususiya for them. They're also not allowed to marry after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They're also nine in number, where it can be more than four in number for everyone else. So it's not ghulu for them. That's the hukum for them, and is ghulu for everybody else. The hadith, the qawlun fas, first of all, it's one of the matters of the amal. The mas'ala of how the women dress. So, so why would they, the scholars need textual proof for this? Now, of course, we need we have textual fr- proof for everything. But don't the sahaba, didn't their wives, didn't they know how their wives dressed? Didn't the tabi'in know how their moms dressed? Who are sahabiyat, right? They know how their moms dressed. They know how, you know, their wives are supposed to dress. They never went outside. So how did they go to Mecca? How did they make Umrah? How did they make Hajj? Didn't they have to walk outside in the street? It's, it's far-fetched to say that women in that time never walked out in the street. That's far-fetched. They did walk out in the street for, for, for needs. Even the time of the Prophet said Aisha, the whole hadith of ifk, she learned that she was being accused when she was out with Umm Mistah walk, getting something from the marketplace. Right? So they did walk around. Didn't they know how to dress? So that's from the amal. Another um, uh, perspective of that, the textual evidence is the hadith of Al-Fadl ibn Abbas. When a woman came up to him and she was very attractive and she and the, and the Prophet turned his face to not look at her, therefore she wasn't covering her face. That's number one. That's the first proof right there. And he didn't... He didn't uh, tell her to cover her face. Otherwise, no niqabi is going to come and you're looking at her. No. So that's first proof. Second proof right there is that uh, on that issue or that instance is she asked what have to be has to be covered. He said everything except this and this. So that's the textual proof. Now what about Qadi Ayyad on one of the famous Islam uh, QA websites? Qadi Ayyad said it's mustahab. The answer to that is that Qadi Ayyad, not all of his fatwa represent the dominant opinion of the Maliki school. He came very early before the final say was was documented. Khalil is the final say because he took from the four dominant, uh, most authoritative books in the Maliki school. Okay, He took from Al-Lakhmi, he took from Ibn Yunus, which is called Mus'haf al-Malikiyya, Ibn Yunus's book. He took from Ibn Rushd al-Jad, the grandfather, Ibn Rushd al-Bani wa tahsil and he took from, 
Al-Lakhmi, Ibn Yunus, Ibn Rushd al-Jad. Oh, the fourth one's skipping me. But he took from four... Uh, took from Al-Lakhmi's teacher. What's, who's Al-Lakhmi's teacher? Um, we'll get that for you another time. But he took that from those four... The name's skipping me right now. But he took from those four books. So he is the dominant opinion. Can we test Hassan now? All right, you should be good to go. Bismillah. Let's try it. Oh, still not working. So it tries, try StreamYard. Go into StreamYard. Make sure his mic is on. Try settings. Go. It's from StreamYard. It must be from StreamYard. Because when you tried YouTube, it worked. Uh, meanwhile, let's take a few questions on... Um, from here before we get to that one of the things about niqab I would wear it only in so much as I hate the gazes of people and particularly the ayin that people give so if I was all covered I would be protecting myself completely okay so seturul wajj covering the face not out of aura but because it is possibly uh, fitna yeah that uh, it, that could even be farad at some point right it's not far off that a scholar could say it's fud, but it's going to be fud based on what? Based on ijtihad. Based on the uh, the the, the uh, determination that this is fitna. So you determine it's fitna. For another woman, it may not be fitna. Okay. Is it disliked to fast while traveling? No, not at all. In fact, it's prefer preferable to fast while traveling. Allah says in the Quran. Right? What's the ruling on niqab in the Hanafi school? Listen, I, I answered correctly in the Maliki school and the internet went nuts. I'm not even going to touch the Hanafi school. Someone else will answer that. Uh, Omar al-Hashimi is here. Omar al-Hashimi, are you here? Or is that somebody else? Okay. Is fitna determined by the individual, by the community? I think it's determined by the individual. Fitna is different from person to person, I believe. There are there are some of the fuqaha said any kafir is a fasiq because he doesn't believe that he has to lower his gaze from you. I don't think I don't see I didn't see my shiuch teaching teaching us that. Sheikh Al Maghidi definitely didn't teach that. Who we just interviewed uh, on this subject about a week, uh, two three months ago. Uh, Sheikh Sadik never taught that. Sheikh Rami never taught that. So, what is the ruling while on fasting while sick? If it's marad shadid, a severe sickness. Okay, if it is a a sickness that is requires medicine and is severe, and you can't just sort of go through it, then yes, you 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 don't fast. You you break your fast, and you make up a day. Is it true that we cannot pray nawafil if we have qada prayer? The answer is yes, that is true. There is a fatwa only that. You can pray tarawih and go to the masjid for the sake of the community benefits only when you finish your qada for the day. That's a fatwa, but the ruling is that there's no nafila. For, there's no nafila for anybody um, if they have if they owe qada prayers. All right, we're here and we're fixed. Let's reintroduce our guest for today, Dr. Hassan Abdus Salam. Thank you so much for your patience while we had those fix that mic. Welcome to the Safina Society. Nothing but facts live stream. Let me ask, let me get straight to this and tell me. Um, tell us what you're based, where you're based out of and what's your political activity look like? So I'm uh, currently based for, out of Minneapolis, where I, I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. MashaAllah. The political work that uh, we're doing is the Abandoned Biden Movement, which we began on November 1st, after the president passed our ceasefire deadline day and never called for a permanent ceasefire on October 31st. And ever since then, it's been history by the power and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we've been organizing across the country, particularly in the swing states, uh, and creating the, by again, all for, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by his power, 
trying to create the conditions for the, our ummah here in the United States to respond to the devastation, the policy of death of this administration. What, what are you a professor of in Minnesota? I'm a professor of strategy, human rights, and sociology. Uh, wow. In- Mashallah. So tell me something. Um, I agree with the, the abandoned Biden ap- approach. I agree the idea that anyone who basically green lights a genocide by doing nothing and then sending aid simultaneously, this nifaq doesn't work. And this is the way Iblis plays games uh, where you do two things simultaneously to please everybody. It doesn't work like that. I agree with it. I agree that everybody should be punished and then you'll deal with the next consequence later. So Trump is not going to be better. He'd probably be worse, but you'll deal with that when you get there. So I agree with that. But what do you, how do you respond to the critics who say Trump is going to be worse? Why should we abandon Biden when Trump is worse? The, yeah, the former president prevented our, our family and friends and colleagues from entering into the country. But Mr. Biden killed them. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. What's truly extraordinary is that often people think that uh, the political equation or the way that the media characterizes the choice is between two candidates, as if this is an election about our individual self-interest. But the reality is it's not a question about well, what's the alternative with, a, with an answer such as the last name of a political candidate. We think at Abandoned Biden, the question is, what is the alternative world? Imagine rewarding the president after killing thousands of our brothers and sisters. That would mean political suicide. Muslim Americans would would Mm self-immolate and in effect say that they are completely irrelevant. They came out and protested again and again and again, and then they rewarded their own murderer. And so what the way that we think of this is it's not really a question between Biden or Trump. It's about whether we punish Biden yep. or we don't punish Biden. Correct, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, if you let this slide, you've basically proven that you're completely uh, inept and that anyone can do what they want with you. That's, yeah. So that's, it's an absolute death. Whereas if you do this and you, and you punish a candidate and the next one comes as worse, you actually haven't actually, this is a lesser of harms in a sense because... Um, the first is guaranteed loss. No one will ever respect you. The second one is now I, I just will have to face a bigger challenge now at this point or a bigger enemy. But it's, that's not a guaranteed loss because it's not guaranteed that he'll be worse. It's speculated that he'll be worse, but it's not guaranteed that he'll be worse. Right. Ah. And even if he is worse, so deal with it. Right. So you have one is guaranteed and one is speculative. And you always take... Right. The in terms of the negative, you go with what's speculatively harmful versus what is guaranteed to be harmful. Absolutely. Mashallah, that is, is super thoughtful. One of the things that uh, a lot of folks don't understand about American politics uh, and understandably so is that when constituencies actually affect change and demonstrate that they have power, that they're the swingiest group in the electorate. Yeah. Both parties start to move in their direction. Mm-hmm. So one thing a lot of folks might not uh, understand is that the first term won't necessarily be a photocopy of the next term. Uh, if we demonstrate that we had the impact that we hope we will, then the Republicans will also move in our direction and the Democrats will experience a reckoning. Remember, it's just four years. The prophets struggled a huge number of uh, events and suffering again and again, torture, exile, Uh, experience of uh, famine, uh, loss of family members uh, at battle uh, before he actually re-entered into Mecca. And so four years under admittedly a distasteful character is still part of the overall struggle towards the liberation of this ummah. Well, I was in uh, Palestine conducting research in the whole uh, 2022 from February till December. On December 1st, there was a national alert for me and my research assistant. We were um, we were arrested, handcuffed. I was arrested, handcuffed as I was entering into Al-Aqsa on my hands and, and legs, stripped naked, paraded through the old city, sent to Al-Maskubaya basement, tortured and then de- deported after 23 days. 
I was working with activists, youth activists, and we, we had a plan. Um, and we called for the liberation of Palestine. One of the things is that when I was in Al-Aqsa with the youth, we would often say that Al-Ahtilal is not just, the occupation is not only in Jerusalem, that Jerusalem is a symbol of the occupation of this ummah. Mm -hmm. So the way for us to actually affect change, subhanAllah, might not be in a country that's populated with Muslims, but coming from the United States by actually bringing down, deposing the autocrat in the White House, perhaps the largest, biggest Zionist in history, mm -hmm. the top a superpower, it would represent one of the greatest victories in this ummah. An yeah. ummah that's been weak and needs so badly a victory. Um, and so we're, we believe that on November 5th, we might have an opportunity there for the ummah to celebrate across the planet and for us to finally rupture the first significant rupture between the United States and Israel that you're referring to, the constant billions of dollars for a very small population that they arm them to the teeth and then attack folks who are within a walled community that have no place to go and then declare this security. Mm -hmm. Nothing but genocide and terror. A question for you now. How does how do we know that the loss is coming from the Muslim vote? Well, at the band in Biden, in particular in October, when we began the presentations, a lot of folks would often ask the question, can you show us that uh, the margin that will be made up between the mm -hmm. two candidates will come from Muslim Americans? And we find uh, in a preliminary study that 111 electoral votes, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, Florida, Nevada and North Carolina are also added that make it nine. But those seven initial states I listed are places where Muslim Americans, we believe, can make the difference if they come out. But I often tell folks, why are we thinking small? This is not this is a movement. And within it, there's an election. We have to talk to our fellow Americans in the same way in the best tradition of Dawah of our beloved prophet, Ali Sadsalam, who spoke to everybody and including getting allies who never converted to Islam, as we know his uncle being perhaps the exemplar of that dawah. And so we feel fundamentally we need to reach out to Gen Z, to African Americans, to Latinos. If you peel small percentages, you're way beyond the margin that Biden won those swing states. Mm -hmm. So we believe that we have to come together and we're asking for volunteers and for us to talk to our fellow Americans it's an opportunity for us to be enmeshed in this uh, uh, country, for us to transform not just the political apparatus, but American culture itself. Yeah. Uh, when people, uh, I see one commentator saying very colorfully here, you don't cut your nose to split your face. Uh, again, in uh, defense of keeping Biden as opposed to going with Trump. But the thing is that as, as wacky as Trump may seem, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a war during his time because there wasn't a war in the first four years, right? So it's really a question. It's not a guarantee. It's not like he did it before. It's not like we're saying Bush versus Biden. Like George H.W. Bush, the second, like we know what his record is with Iraq, with Iraq and Afghanistan, okay? That would be fair to say that, wait a second, hold on, which one is worse, Right. But in the case of Trump, yeah, the, the whole scene around him is is one thing, but there is no war record with him. So that's why I think it's, it is fair to say that to not punish Biden is, is an absolute harm. Like, you know, for sure, at this point, you are you've declared your impotence. Uh, Trump coming in is not a guarantee that there's going to be a war. It's not like it's it was H.W. Bush who gave us precedent of two wars. So I'm thinking now, though, the the people who, the abandoned Biden folk, I'm trying to think of when Muslims put in Bush over Clinton. And they said Clinton, yeah, he did have some bombings and he and he wasn't moral. Bush at least has family values. And then Bush came in and it was the biggest is you know, political mistake to put Bush in. And those people ha have no answer. Like they just, 
The people who supported Bush, they just have no answer. They said we screwed up. So let's hypothetically now draw out a couple scenarios. Let's draw out the scenario that Trump comes in. I, I personally believe he would have won anyway, right? But he's probably going to be, it's probably going to be bigger now with the abandoned Biden campaign, right? Bigger margin. But let's hypothetically say Trump comes in and he's, and really bad things happen. Then people will turn on advocates such as, what's his name? Uh, uh, the guest that we just had from England. Uh, what's his name? I can't remember, but he was very big on the abandoned Biden campaign brother sammy hamdi sammy hamdi yeah then they're going to turn on yourself they're going to turn on everybody who's part of the abandoned binded are you do you have you know what are you ready to say to them by the way our goal is to get the backlash we want to unelect biden and take the blame by taking mm -hmm. the blame we would send a signal to the political landscape that we affected the change very and interesting very interesting it's so by taking the blame, you're actually also taking credit for having some effect, right? So if yeah, that's that's a great, that's a very good way to put it. Continue. Uh, absolutely, and so we we are looking forward to experiencing that backlash that we know will result in a transformation in the Democratic Party in four years, where they're yep. going to establish having a red line to ever have foreign policies like the one we see witnessed here before mm -hmm. us and so we feel really strongly that we have to have this moment of transformation by the way a str strategist will come before uh mr trump in the oval office and he'll, they'll say quite clearly to him don't antagonize the muslims mm. they demonstrated their power yep. you don't want them to run back into the arms of the democratic party and so we're going to see recalculations. That's how politics works in America. And so this is what I mean by it's not necessarily a photocopy. Yeah, yeah. we definitely want to take credit. And by the way, you mentioned that you think that uh, Mr. Trump will likely win. Well, and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alam, he is the most knowledgeable. The recent polling that I see suggests that it will be very close. Already, as is. Ajit. Yes, yes. Ajit. we see we see in some polling Mr. Trump is ahead, and some polling Mr. Biden is ahead. Ajit. And the conventional practice is to take the aggregate polling, which mm -hmm. which in a recent uh, recent calculation, I think Mr. Trump was like 0.5 percentage points ahead. Which, mm -hmm. by the way, implies that you can have various outcomes when you look at the specific swing states. Because remember, popular vote is not what determines the yeah. outcome; it's the electoral college count. What is the, uh, tell us about, were you involved in the Michigan no name? Tell us about that whole story. Yeah, so our people, abandoned Biden leaders in Michigan in the Michigan chapter were actively involved in pursuing the uncommitted. And we had folks volunteer, we had folks phone bank, and it demonstrated that the theory we operated since October was accurate that we can show we had numbers, by the way, including non-Muslim Americans who came out in droves to show this president in elections which often don't bring people out in the primary, specifically with an incumbent president. And we showed that we had the numbers to, uh, to effectively make Michigan swing away from the president in the general. So we this is why you're seeing in recent reporting that mr biden is shouting is angry his strategists are telling him he's likely going to lose michigan and georgia we when i look at our map and our strategy we feel that we can make sure that mr biden loses nine states 133 electoral votes and he won over trump with 74 electoral votes in 2020. so and each state that he loses adds to the power of muslim americans into the future. What's the number one Muslim swing state in America? The number one Muslim swing state in America is likely Wisconsin. Really? Um, uh, but a lot of folks don't know the media is focusing on Michigan because it's yeah. a huge population. But Wisconsin is expected to be so swingy that uh, it's possible that 100 people, 1,000 people, uh, uh, 15,000 uh, 15, people will determine the outcome. And there are far more Muslim Americans uh, than that than that margin. So 
Uh, and yeah, a lot of the media isn't aware. Uh, I, they were surprised. They often mention Michigan, and I told uh, you know I tell journalists that actually we can still win this, meaning Biden will lose, even if he won Michigan uh, by locking him out in states like Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and Florida, where we have our leaders actively organizing day and night to make sure that we protect our mm. beloved. But like you said, I love that, dear brother. I mean, you, you were apologizing that I was here waiting, but just listening yeah. to your wise words is typical. Um, mashallah. This is one of those moments where Muslim Americans might be the most powerful Muslims on the planet, and they must respond. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, mm. Minnesota, Georgia, these are parts of the body of the Ummah that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in his hadith, and that we must be feeling excruciating pain in all of these locations in America, and that we must respond and take this responsibility seriously to make sure that our Ummah is protected and to signal, not just for Palestine, because once you demonstrate you have power, it won't, it won't only be for Palestine, but it would be an extraordinary moment for the entire Ummah to show Muslim Americans, imagine the headline, that Muslim Americans delivered America away mm -hmm. from their oppressor. And so uh, it will have ripple effects across the world and it will demonstrate finally that when we organize and we we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for support, that we will protect our ummah, that we truly believe that we are a single body and that the harm in Palestine is felt every day by each and every one of us. Let me ask you another question. Again, uh, from the opposite side, we're playing chess here, right? Someone says to you, Biden is not guilty. He couldn't have stopped Israel anyway. Israel is a runaway train. It's out of control. Nobody can stop them. True or false? False. When I was in prison, the Americans knew that uh, everything that was happening, and they allowed it. My torturers and interrogators said they're allowing this to happen. The United States presents itself as a weak party only with Israel. Mm. But then we know fully well they're politicking in the Ukraine and other parts of the world in which they definitely flex their muscles. The United States is the reason for the oppression by Israel since 1948. Mm -hmm. 14 presidents, seven Democrats, and seven Republicans, mm -hmm. each equally contributing and sustaining these attacks. No question that if Mr. Biden threatened uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu and told him that he will no longer get funding and that he mm -hmm. will not have the support of the administration, he will have no choice but to back off. Okay, so you actually, uh, now that your torturers told you America's allowing this. Okay. But Absolutely. They're, but they, they're torturers. They're laughing, yes. So they could be lying, and that's part of the torture. Absolutely, except for the fact that I learned that, th and I confirmed this after I arrived, that they basically allowed it to take place, and they uh, stood back and asked very disturbing questions about me uh, to my research assistant. Uh, we've been questioned uh, by the FBI after we arrived. And effectively, this is an administration that is two-faced. They currently realize that Muslim Americans are increasingly uh, uh, powerful. And so they have specific discourses directed domestically to Muslim Americans, like, Wonderful, Ramadan Mubarak. Yep, and, yep, all and that so stuff. On, and Yaid, uh, and great, have a great Eid. But on the other hand, in when it comes to Israel, they provide them complete carte blanche to do the attacks that yep. they that they wish. And the, the hope the hope of the administration is not that they're going to actually stop the attacks in, over Gaza. The hope is that Muslim Americans will look out for their own self interest, that they will not uh, bear the thought of being insulted by the former president. And so uh, that's their goal is, is to sort of focus on that uh, 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 and, and make us fearful about the next four years. And this is something that, that I also kind of want to mention to my fellow Muslim Americans, you know, please uh, volunteer, join the movement, 
and 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 donate. This is so critical for us to demonstrate that we're a powerful community at at AbandonBiden24.com. But one one thing that is really critical is for us at the end, even if we would not gain a single drop of power, we must sacrifice. Four years under Trump, we is nothing like a single day in Gaza. And we must experience what the Prophet said, which is to feel the pain of our brothers and sisters. We should not be able to sleep. We should not be able to endure the images that we're seeing. And so the pleasure of a genocidaire to be deposed by, by our own hands should be sufficient to motivate us day and night, regardless of the outcome of what comes. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see our sacrifice and then reward us and protect us. Never doubt what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has that for, for when that a time will come with the Dajjal where Nar is really Jannah and Jannah is Nar. Where, where hellfire is truly paradise and paradise is hellfire. And perhaps Biden, that is what appears to be lovely, is truly what's harmful. And mm -hmm. Trump, the alternative, who I'm not, we're never suggesting anyone should vote for, appears to be evil, which he is on its face. But good things may happen for the Ummah as a result, despite him coming in. And again, I really emphasize we do not recommend voting for uh, uh, such a distasteful candidate. But as, as Dr. Al-Masri mentioned, the, obviously in a two-party system, the likelihood is that he would win if Biden lost. Okay, uh, let me ask you this. When the Biden, uh, abandon Biden uh, campaign, what is it exactly? Is it just a series of getting awareness? Um, are you telling people to vote in a certain way, to not vote at all? What it, what is the movement exactly? Physically speaking, like, what do we do? Yeah, so it's it's a movement in which we're calling on people, which includes that element you talked about, for folks to be aware about this grave immorality that's being committed by our administration that we voted in droves for in 2020. But part of that movement is to act, mm -hmm. is to affect change. And so within that movement is an election, which is part of our broader toolbox. It's just one piece of it. So we're organizing an election campaign without a candidate, in effect, trying to ensure that we punish Biden for it to be a historic moment in American politics and bring civil rights into foreign policy to mm -hmm. ensure that we don't get Medicare and security and we get and we forgive debt uh, while we shed blood across the planet. And so what we're asking folks to do is to join the campaign to get out the vote. To, have, uh, to tell our fellow Americans who are Muslim and non-Muslim to join the campaign and never vote against your conscience. And so this is precisely what we're asking folks to do. And if you go to our website, it will funnel you into the, uh, into the movement where we would uh, recruit you as a potential volunteer, as well as we really uh, would appreciate your generosity because campaigns take a lot of money. Just the president has seen this is such a major problem for him. So he announced a $30 million ad campaign to target Gen Z to compensate for the losses among our community. I want to share with you a strategy. Uh, minorities, fringe minorities like Muslims, this is a political idea now. They're too fringe and maybe even too controversial for anybody to go to bat for them. However, they're large enough in number to be able to destroy a candidate and that that is the strategy of this the way we are right now that's the strategy of muslims i found that to be wonderful do you agree with that strategy 100 percent. it's exactly what the strategy we're operating with we mm -hmm. don't take the assumption that we need to do this in an insular way that it's an opportunity to transform our culture and to bring of fellow Americans from various minority groups, African-Americans, Latinos, uh, progressives, Gen Z uh, progressives who are very disturbed by what they're seeing. We have a strategy in Nevada that includes Muslim Americans and Gen Z. We have a strategy in Pennsylvania that includes Muslim Americans and African-Americans. And so, and the same with Georgia and North Carolina, African-Americans play a major role in Arizona with Latinos. And we feel it's an opportunity for people to learn about how in our tradition, 
we believe that if you kill one soul, it's as though you killed all people. Mm -hmm. And when you save one soul, it's as though you saved all people, all people, it's not just Muslims, oh, all people. And this is a message to all Americans. We ask you by, by, by in truth and in, and with great humility to join us in a campaign to make sure that no political candidate in the future will violate what truly goes against American conscience. There was a Martin Luther King who called for civil rights and voting rights that many people heroize. But mm -hmm. a lot of folks don't know that Martin Luther King spoke against the Vietnam War and broad international, broad intervention by the United States abroad. And so to abandon Biden, we're also guided by those voices, voices like Martin Luther King, who called on us to bring civil rights into foreign policy. And so we ask our brothers and sisters among the African-American community, among Latinos, among progressives and Gen Z, please don't lose this moment. Because if Mr. Biden comes back into office, that's the red carpet being rolled out for perpetual death and destruction in communities worldwide, in Latin America, in the African continent, and in Far East Asia. We can't allow that. Tell me what about people who live in affirmed blue or red states? How can they participate? And for those in England who don't know what we're talking about, the blue state is a state that Every four years, it goes to the Democrats. Enough Democratic people in there, they vote for the Democrat. Red state Absolutely. for the Republican. New Jersey, for example, and California are blue states. Texas is a red state, for example. And then purple states are what we call the swing states that could go either way. And now Muslims have enough numbers to actually damage a candidate. No one is going to go to bat for us, but we can damage a candidate. Right. And take uh, maybe 4% from them or 3%, a very important number, you know, that could eventually 3% here, 4% there, another 5% there could tip the balance for this candidate. So tell us, what does someone do from, from a red or a blue state? Yeah. And so we do have a 50 state strategy that we announced uh, in late December of 2023. And it involves having folks come in and volunteer actively in abandoned Biden. We have operations where we work to connect with media to put out the word about abandoned biden mm -hmm. we need folks to do work in data we need campaigners connectors organizers we need folks to create fundraisers and one thing as you mentioned to our ummah abroad uh, including our ummah in the western world that in many of these so-called red and blue states there are huge muslim populations california new york new jersey illinois um uh, texas and so we need those folks and their energy, and they can play a major role. We have folks from all across the country working in operations, in media, in social media, putting out the word throughout the country. Also, Dr. Al-Masri was emphasizing the campaign, but we feel that the campaign is one element of the movement. We want a national movement like Black Lives Matter uh, and, and the dreamers on, on trying to protect the rights of undocumented people. So to do so, we need to actively engage Americans across the nation from coast to coast for them to understand that what the stakes are and for all of us to change, not just merely in the swing states, to have a change of mind about American foreign policy and its perception that it could project power with, with impunity and without any reflection. It comes in like a giant and destroys people's lives and their futures. And that's something that many Americans, once they know that it's happening, will be completely averse to. And so a movement involves all of us across the nation. And so we ask everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim, to actively be part of Abandoned Biden. Okay, Omar, can you open the website up? Uh, let's show everyone what the website looks like. AbandonedBiden24.org or .com. Did you get both? Uh, dot com. Dot com. Abandon Biden. Can you tell, uh, while he's pulling that up, can you tell us who are the main personalities in this uh, in this movement? Yeah, so we, we have lots of folks in the movement. We have assigned co-chairs in all the state chapters, uh, which are focused in the swing states. But we have folk, folk, people working in operations, people working on data and research, hundreds of people right now. And everyone obviously plays a major role uh, uh, in theory, I co-founded, but that's too precious for us to speak. I work with 
uh, Brother Jelani Hossein, who uh, works in his personal capacity, but uh, has been an active member of the community, Muslim community in Minnesota, uh, as we began in October. But this is not really about persons. It's truly about bringing everyone together, because at the end, you can never make an impact without bringing hundreds, thousands, millions of people. Yeah. And lots of people have contributed immensely to this, subhanAllah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's one of those uh, movements, we hope, in which people can contribute actively uh, from all different walks of life, and that each person is important, a gem that's transformational in terms of reaching our impact. If you can change the vote of one person, yeah, then you truly you truly made a massive impact. You are like the founders. You are like the co-chairs. You are like the leaders in operations. Mm -hmm. And this, and I can't emphasize that enough. Just like the Prophet said about, if you just t speak in a message of a single ayah, to balig, or to message a single ayah, or a single sign, or a single mm -hmm. word, and that's our duty to transform people by communicating our message and changing votes well, we have the power nice. of the pen, and we also know about the power of the sword. But some folks don't realize there is the power of the vote. Yeah, no. the ballot or the bullet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So and that's what that yeah that's that's what is uh, uh, that our our world today is 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 the vote, and the vote is uh, essentially the the day that it comes where it's said that. Being too pro-Israel is not good for your campaign. That's you've said that. That's it. That is literally it. And that and then it's going to start with, you know, this is a big one. This is the presidency, right? But it could also start now with with congressmen. It could start now with um, uh, with senators, right? And so on and so forth. Until being, you know, pro pro Palestine, it's not going to be. Um, uh, viable. And now for that, let me ask you this question. Is that going to be solely in the Democratic Party? No, I, I don't believe that's going to be the case because what happens when you're the swingiest group is that you become the kingmaker and both parties begin to seek support from the, from that community. Plus, we would show, the word is, we show we're a credible threat. Mm -hmm. uh, not just merely because of our numbers, but because we, we managed to transform the electorate. But we are so influential that we change people's minds. And those people, each person in the electorate is someone you want to covet for your party. So mm -hmm. the Republicans and Democrats would move in our direction. Yes, the Democrats would have a reckoning, but everyone will fully understand that we have a red line, a new red line in American politics. As you know, the red line with evangelicals that has transformed the Republican Party with abortion. It mm -hmm. was in 1980 where Ronald Reagan won a landslide with evangelicals in response to Roe v. Wade, the uh, legal case for folks to know that allowed for abortion in the 1970s. And when Ronald Reagan came, he set in pace a revolution that led many years later, four decades later, to the uh, basically the overruling of Roe v. Wade, that case that enabled uh, uh, abortion to be practiced across the nation. And so we would introduce a new red line. Evangelicals have a red line. You can never, ever negotiate with them if you are a party that allows for abortion. And so we would have a red line, and then we would go through a phase of negotiation with these parties. And what's curious about our position, unlike evangelicals that find their place singly in the Republican Party, is that our red line with the Democratic Party is one in which they would have to respond because they need our numbers yeah. uh, in order to win. With the Republican Party, they're going to be intrigued because of the polarization, because of the fact that they realize they won because of us. Yeah. They have no choice but then to rethink about their policies with respect to Muslims. It's mm -hmm. extremely easy for the Republican Party, for example, to get rid of travel bans. There's yeah. really no loss there, for example. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. there's real opportunities. What about the the very hard ideological stance that the Republicans have on this subject? Well, to the on, point that on you know, Israel, yeah, on Israel, yeah. And but I I I feel when I look at history, as I mentioned, seven Republicans and seven Democrats, Subhanallah, up to this point, both parties are 
actively Zionist um, in a manner that is uh, one can say is equal uh, to, to a certain extent. And, and so there isn't really much difference. The reality is that when you punish Biden, and, and we can even say no hard feelings, it's not even personal, it just happens that you're in the White House, and now we manage to mobilize. And so we're going to take this opportunity to mobilize in the name of your attacks on Palestine to send a clear signal and punish you. But the reality is put any name, including the 13 last presidents since 1948, what we would be doing is using him as a symbol to the entire landscape. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, by breaking uh, and deposing Biden, we would be breaking and rupturing the Zionist link between the United States and Israel and would begin a transformation for both parties. You're absolutely right. We're really not in a fight merely with Biden. He's just a placeholder for a fight with the entire political apparatus that sides and is bought by APAC. Let's talk about um, congressmen or senators. Or after Biden, who's next that you're going to go after? Well, we're, we're focusing on Biden. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know that other folks have created 501c4s. And in, in great humbleness, we feel that we want to just manage bite-sized. Already the presidency is huge. And we know our, our capacity. We want to do it right. We have a responsibility to the Ummah. And so we acknowledge that we can't do everything in seven months. Brothers and sisters, the election is in a few seconds from now. So mm -hmm. the reality is that we know that we're working with other people. We're not in competition with them that are working on Congress. We love our brothers and sisters doing that. We want to give them every support. But we're focusing on the presidency and the ideas that the organization that's launching Abandoned Biden and coordinating it will focus into the future on the presidency, like the struggle we'll experience under Trump, making sure that he's punished yeah. in the midterms and so on, until we course correct this country's evil and move towards a hope and morality to be established throughout the world. Remember, ending facade and fahishat and corruption across this planet is part of our deen. So... Let's talk now about, um, we talked about after Biden, and I think this take, tearing, taking down one candidate after another is going to be the mode of operation going forward. Uh, but I have to say, I was surprised that Wisconsin is a swing state. Like, what is the percentage of Muslims there? Or is abandoned Biden reaching outside of Muslims? It's not just Muslim uh, vote. Yeah, we're, we're, we're reaching, our intention, like you mentioned, very clearly um, uh, that we're, we're definitely reaching and it's, a, it's critical uh, as being a movement to reach out to many different other constituencies, mashallah, yeah. or clearly dedicated to the idea that life must be protected and that this president has violated the value of life. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, Wisconsin is actually one of the states where most of Americans alone can determine the outcome. There are wow. 1% of, yes, there is approximately... 60,000 uh, voters, uh, Muslim Americans, and the the states can, in this uh, round, can potentially go with 1,000 votes. 2,000 votes will determine who will win that state. It would be malpractice mm -hmm. uh, if we just listen to the journalists. And so we're going to do everything we can to make yeah. sure every single state where we have potential will go down. And uh, in history, that we were the reasons we take the blame for delivering it away from mm -hmm. this. And so uh, that Wisconsin is gold. <laughs> I have to say, no, it's not enough to not vote for Biden. You have to vote for the guy who's going to defeat him. Well, right? we, we feel, we, we, so we have a committee that's working on candidate selection. Uh, a lot of abandoned, we haven't come to, or endorsed uh, anyone. I can tell you, a lot of our people are feel Mr. Trump is truly distasteful. Uh, and so the argument has been that it's likely that an independent candidate would be selected there. And we have interviews with uh, the Green Party and Cornell West. Uh, uh, what I want and my responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to ensure that we win. And, and so uh, I, I just want us to be all together and united so that we, there is no fitna, no division. And so the goal is to uh, create shura. And we've been doing hearings since early February, examining leave it blank, examining a write-in, examining independent candidates. 
And everyone is discussing the questions you brought up, by the way, brother, that uh, sometimes um, a vote for a candidate, or actually not sometimes, but a vote for a particular candidate goes further than voting for another candidate. We feel it's important that everyone vote, 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 exclamations, mm -hmm. uh, because that shows you're part of the system. And then we can establish that we were the ones who have a credible threat, that we were behind this, that we can take the blame, that it's historically written, that it's because of us. And so that's critical. But the question is vote for who and we're taking our time. We're going to have a large convention, August 31st, uh, September 1st, where we're going to announce that endorsement. We're going to bring folks from across the country. The media, national media, international media will be there after the Democratic um, convention. And we will uh, uh, try to do the best we can to deliver the most sound, sound endorsement so that we can truly achieve our goal, inshallah. So Milwaukee, uh, sorry, Wisconsin, I have here a, a gentleman named Jason Atrida saying that a lot of Muslims in Minimini, Green Bay, Appleton, Milwaukee, and Madison, right, yes. Wisconsin. So then we said Michigan. I would assume Michigan, humongous swing state, right, yes. where the Muslims would have the most impact, probably, I guess, after Wisconsin now, right? Actually, the, the thing is that Michigan is emphasized because from all the swing states, 5% of the population is Arab or Muslim American. But mm -hmm. the reality is actually Arizona and Georgia are far more impactful because the margins are expected to be very narrow. The margin in Michigan mm. wasn't as narrow as Georgia and in Arizona. And there are significant Muslims in Arizona and in Georgia to me. So the question is, so the media looks often at populations of Muslims relative to other states. But the real way to look at it is population relative to expected margin. Whether you Oh, look that's at a great way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. The aggregate polling. So, you, so Michigan doesn't have a thin margin. It has a, a pretty wide margin towards what, Democratic? Yes. It, well, it's okay. it's not a, a significantly wide margin. It's just wider than Georgia and Arizona. Mm. And so you you get uh, you have to make up, a, for example, in 2020, 150,000. But in Georgia, only approximately 10,000 votes made. The oh, I see what you're saying. So there, there's more of a swing there. That's why like Jersey's got a ton of Muslims, but you're not even going to come close because the margin for the Democrats is so high. So then exactly. Ohio then. Is famously Ohio and Florida are famously like almost 50 50, right? Exactly. Traditionally, Ohio and Florida, and we're located in Florida. Recently, Ohio has now trended very strongly red. Mm -hmm. People are arguing that might be the case in Florida, mm -hmm. but um, Florida is kind of unpredictable uh, by the power and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows all things. And, the, and so we are definitely there because we don't know what's going to happen. And so yeah. because it has a proclivity of swinging. We're actively campaigning to ensure that we're locking Mr. Biden out. We have a strategy to lock out Mr. Biden in the states of Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida, and to contain him in the north in Wisconsin and Michigan. And so, and, and that's uh, where, he ha where he has to defend those states. So even if he wins them, he still loses. Because yeah. if we just defend and lock him out in the states I said earlier in the south, he can't win this election even if he won Michigan. Because he'll be busy with those states and not campaigning elsewhere. First of all, do you even think uh, Biden can campaign? Just, can he physically travel around like this? He seems like, I think that it's, this is a whole other subject, but I think it's this is abuse of the elderly, what they're doing to him. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. At, at Abandon Biden, one of the things often the media asks, what's curious about the, the conversation about the age is that uh, in our tradition, I don't think age really has been a concern for us. We, we yeah. have so many leaders uh, who, who are, mashallah, elderly, and we respect them and their wisdom and, and their knowledge. And so at Abandon Biden, we focused on the fact that Mr. the, the president has become a genocidaire and uh, who, who is off limits, and that we, we would have been supportive of a candidate that protected lives abroad, mm -hmm. even if that candidate were 90 years of age. Yeah. And he lost the opportunity of allies would have never had this concern because so many in the electorate currently, particularly Gen Z, have concerns about his age, even, even if the events never took place in Gaza. So, um, and so he could have counted on us 
and 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 potentially won because of us in 2024 but he lost us on that on that point yeah and it's not if age is not if so much the issue as health i should say because it seems like that um he he falters he mumble he mixes up his words he physically falls and it seems to be like his health is there's no way this person is going to do a grueling you know four months of campaigning and getting on your jet every other day and the last month you're getting on your jet two three times a day and giving three four or five talks a day between live and on tv like when you're on the plane you're on tv when as soon as you land right on the tarmac you have to give you know a pep talk uh campaign rally you got to do three four rallies a day so it seems like uh well we'll see but here's another question that came up and this came from i can't remember who who wrote this but it's a rich interesting question here i think it was rich he says what are the chances that they sub in Michelle Obama at the last minute? Yeah, then that, what? that is, that is, uh, then you've won that. It, yes, exactly. We, 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 that is possible. And, and abandoned Biden includes the president dropping out. Of course, as soon as he drops out, we have to capture can the candidates to ensure that our policies are properly represented in the white house for whoever is going to be the nominee, because we will not support someone who stands by the policies that are currently being undertaken by this administration. So whoever that person is, if they're going to continue the genocide, we will simply continue with our campaign. But yes, it would be, it would mean, and we will immediately announce and celebrate that uh, and take credit for that person having dropped. I have, a, I, dropped. I have a problem with the way uh, that, uh, Muslims are in right now because right now we can only take down a democratic candidate. Okay. We're sort of, the Republicans have moved on without the Muslims. You can't hurt them then. So this is a problem. There need to be Muslim Republicans, right? There needs to be Muslim Democrats and there, the community should, is better off divided up rather than blocked one way or the other. Because if you, we're all Democrats all the time, then why do they need to cater to us? And why would the Republicans try? Because we're already locked in. So this, this is, I mean, this is, the, this is what the Jews did very well. Like, you can't say Jews are de Democrat or Republican. They're going to side with both. They have significant Republicans and significant Democrats. The biggest donors of the Democratic Party are Jews. The, the biggest leader of the conservatives right now in terms of just at least having a talk show is basically Ben Shapiro, right? So that's a smarter strategy than the situation we find ourselves in, which is Muslim is a default Democrat. Uh, so how do we resolve that? Yeah, and, and, and obviously Jewish Americans differ. We, we have many Jewish Americans who come to our press conferences and speak out against the genocide. Uh, but one of the things is that the policy on Israel is the same policy as we've been mentioning by both parties. And so APAC makes sure that both parties, regardless of who wins, will continue with the policies in the Middle East. What's curious is that's exactly what abandoned Biden is about. It's not about the Democrats or the Republicans. When you're yeah. in a single basket, yeah. that party puts you on the lowest rung of the ladder. They, they all, everyone else on top. Exactly. Yeah. And then the other party could completely ignore you. Yeah. And so the idea of being a credible threat and punishing the candidate is to begin to create balance and bring those two parties closer to us by recognizing we have that power. And so our strategy, it may appear that it's only within the Democratic Party because the president is a Democrat, but as I said, that's irrelevant. It's about us demonstrating that we have the power, then rearranging American politics such that we will have influence in both parties and we will not be fearful that when one party wins over the other, then we the policy swing completely in a new direction. Yeah. Remember that by being default Democrats, it implies that just like the way the Republicans ignore you, the Democrats, the Democrats ignore, you, ignore you. Yeah, you, we should be agnostic. We shouldn't even have Muslim Republicans, Muslim Democrats. We should all be agnostic together, meaning whatever is in our interest at this moment in time. That's Absolutely. really the the right approach. Absolutely, yeah. whatever so, benefits the Ummah, whatever increases and enhances goodness and justice, mm -hmm. that is where we will be directed. You're a professor. Do you have a website? Do you have books? Do you have articles? Anything like that? 
Yes, I, I, I have, uh, I have my, my professor web, web page uh, up and uh, I, I have written uh, the, my focus now is singly on this election. And so mm-hmm. my research has had to take a backstage. Uh, it's like working a day and night with leaders across the country. Uh, and I, I feel it's every fiber in me that I need to make sure by the power and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Mr. Biden is deposed. And so that is ahead my work and my research. I'm learning every day and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and nothing happens except by his will. Wonderful. And we'll see. We got a couple months. So you got eight months. What? How many months left? What are we in month three, month 11? So you got eight months, right? Uh, you got eight months of work ahead. It's uh, this political stuff is it's it's it, they're like competitions, these campaigns. And there's a lot of excitement there. And I think it's a lot more exciting when you're just trying to take someone down than trying to put someone up because it just seems to be an easier task. But that's what we Muslims are at right now. We're not mature enough to put up a candidate. Right. We don't have the finances. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have anything. But we can definitely take down a candidate. And uh, we'll see what happens. And inshallah ta'ala, Allah give you tawfiq. If uh, you want to come by, if things change, come by again. Give us the update, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, dear brother, for your constant selflessness and all the amazing work that you do. And if I could share one moment, dear brothers and sisters, We are truly a single body and we have been coming out in protest after protest after protest. Here is an opportunity. Vote actively. Work with us to campaign against this president to affect the change that this ummah needs. You should be feeling excruciating pain because this ummah is weak, but it's only for a short period. Together, we can rupture the Zionist link between the United States and Israel and bring back, inshallah, the glory of this ummah in all parts of the world, including here in the United States. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with each of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us victory. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi Very well said. Very well said. Jazakallah khair to Dr. Again, you are listening to Hassan Abdussalam, a professor of, of human rights, political science, many other sociology, many other subjects in Minnesota. Thank you very much again. And uh, we can now turn to your comments and your questions. We had a 235 on Facebook, uh, uh, on YouTube watching, and probably another 60, 70 on Instagram. So uh, let's open it up. Let's start off with your comments. You want to talk about uh, the interview that we just had, or you want to talk about uh, we can open it up to other questions. Of course, we're going to ask what breaks my fast, blah, blah, blah. How do I pay, pay zakah? Those basic questions that always come around at this time of year, bring them if you have them. No problem. Okay. Um, uh, Rich Go says some people are saying they're going to take, they're going to let Biden take the blame for the Ukraine and Philistine. Biden was a terrible, uh, pre- his presidency was terrible because he was so weak. Right. Everyone sensed that, like, oh, we could do what we want. Right, because technically this is the um, police, you know, the policeman of the world is the United States. When the president's so weak, everyone does what they want. Can we count Tarawih as Qiyamul Layl? It's all one. Tarawih and Qiyamul Layl, as long as you do it before sleeping, it's called Tarawih and uh, It's called Tarawih. When you do it after you sleep, it's called Tahajjud. And both of them are in the broad category of Qiyamul Layl. Okay. Is it permissible to eat kosher meat at a restaurant in the United States? It is. Yes. What organization would you recommend paying Fidya? Fidya, you should give Fidya. Um, by the way, Salman, do we have an answer on Fidya and Kafara? Do that payment and that food have to be for local people? And we know zakat al-fitr and zakat al-ayn, zakat al-mal, have to be d- d- given locally. Now, if you give them abroad, like you send your, send your zakat to Gaza, it's going to be valid, but it's not what is the, the correct way to do it. The correct way to do it is to give your zakat to the local people 
who share in your life and get to see your life and see your wealth and are miskeen. So the, the envy is alleviated from their heart when they receive a nice check of zakah. Okay. So the question is that, is fidya and kafara, are there mandates for that to be local too? We have to research that before we answer. Take, take your time research thing. Are there any cures to ADHD, OCD, and other mental disorders in Islam? Yeah, there's behavioral changes and there are chemical changes and there's medicines and there's techniques for both. There's techniques for behavioral changes and there are medicines for OCD. And I have seen it work on people. Okay. Uh, a lot of families, I think, uh, especially traditional families, they get scared of uh, giving their kids the getting on them on medication. Yeah, I, I worry about those medications very early on. You never know what you're putting in your body. You, you, you're, it's just not known. But do you think? What do you think? Then it's advisable to go with the doctors, even if they're you know they're secular. Uh, go with their advice on taking the medicine, or it depends on how bad I see the issue is. If I feel that it can be altered by behavior, by behavioral changing, terbiya, right? Um, then yeah, I'm going to go with uh, the behavioral changes. If it's something that's out of control now, like I can't change this with behavioral, and this is literally something chemical in, in my estimation, and the doctor that I'm dealing with is not a trigger-happy guy, mm-hmm. then yeah, I'll... Like I'll a last resort, basically. Yeah. Naf- Nafiz reminded me, al mazri these are the four that Al Khalil relied upon. Okay? The four that Khalil relied upon. Mazri? I don't know if they, maybe. Within the method, maybe. Does burning Bukhur and smelling the fragrance break the fast? Yes, because it's a vapor that goes up and can p- produce a drop of liquid down into your throat. The shower is okay, however, because the shower is um, something that you can't avoid. Hey, Omar, can you please put our launch good dash Safina slash Safina Society for our kitchen? Life, uh, continue, we continue to work hard and continue to expand this soup kitchen. No, the website. The launch good, the website, yeah. No, no, the website, the actual website. Yeah. Yeah, the actual website. We're we're, re, we're gutting the basement. The workers are there. The vans are there. Amr, when you went downstairs, you saw the vans, right? The construction has begun. So, But we need help because this is like one big push, and then we're going to have rental units down there. We're going to be able to rent this operation. Yeah, there you go. Click on that website. See where we're at. No, he's from England. Akbar Zeb is from England. Is your, your mic's on, right? Oh, keep your mic on. To hear all the clicks. So. Oh, is that why? Okay. Yeah. So we continue to build out this basement. We're going to have rental units. And now it's going to be a matter of filling in the tenants. And I think we're going to get brothers, right? It should be easy. I want to get uh, students of knowledge in there. Why? Because you know there's not going to be smoking issues. You're not going to be drinking issues. You're not going to be bents. They're going to help out, right? They're going to help out. Their parents are probably doctors. I want Daisy kids. Khans, Shudris, sign up. Let's go. I know your parents got money. I know one of your mom's a doctor. Your dad's a doctor. Okay. Okay. So where we're at, put it on the screen. Yeah, put it on the screen. So we can see where we're at uh, with our launch good campaign. All right. Give us a scroll down a little bit to see where we're at. And we are... 15,086, not bad. Keep it keep it there. Yeah, keep it there. Let it be still there, and let's try to get this to 15,500 today, right? If we get this to 15,500, that would be wonderful because, huh? It's a, right it's a live counter. 214 people have supported us. Some people even put one buck. Some people put one British pound. Whatever it is doesn't make a difference. But if we... Forget 15.5 maybe be too 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 much. Let's just get to 15.2. How's that? 15.2 is very reasonable while we while we answer questions because this is going to go to the apartment, okay, that we're building out an apartment downstairs. That means from the La Cocina house, it will be divided into five segments, three for rental, 
one for the studio and one for the kitchen, right? So we're making use of two parts and we're renting out three parts. So we have a family here right underneath us, another family on the first floor, and then the basement will have, and it's legal. It's all legal, legal egress and everything. Yeah, that's one one apartment. It's two doors to one apartment. Yeah, Mercedes is two doors to one apartment for her family. Oh. And then Edwin downstairs is is one family. Okay. And then downstairs in the basement is going to be by the way, it's going to be luxury. It's like a luxury apartment, right? Cuz we're going to charge a, a decent rent. You get to be part of La Cocina. You get to live here. So we're charging a, a pretty decent rent. We're not going to be charging a lightweight rent. That's why I said I want those kids whose dad's a doctor or something like that. Kid who doesn't know, you know, what prices look like. That's the kid I want. So, man, you're like a candidate for that, aren't you? (laughs) Except you're married now, so I can't do it. Should a student of knowledge prioritize studying or recitation of Quran in Ramadan? In Ramadan, recitation of Quran. Outside of that is studying. And in terms of recitation and Hifz al-Quran, Hifz al-Quran, of course, no doubt about that. Okay. Dominique Benzoin, he says this is enterprising. MashaAllah, good. Yeah, so the donation goes to produce more revenue for the organization. Not donation comes and boom. MashaAllah, Allahu Akbar. On, in one minute, I think, two minutes, we're at 15, 5, 24. And that was a huge. That was, wait a second, didn't I just say 214 supporters before? So two supporters put us over the top. Amazing job. Well done. Amazing job. 15-5. MashaAllah. Uh, there must be Khans and Chaudhrys. Someone was asking, if you're renting it out, how are you a nonprofit? Yes, because nonprofit does not mean you can't produce revenue. Nonprofit means that the revenue doesn't go to the founders or the board members or the directors. The not, it stays within. Second of all, Tax exemption has limits too. So a nonprofit, it's tax exempt when it's doing what it's chartered to do. Let's say we went and opened up, for example, a shop. That shop wouldn't be tax exempt, right? If we owned that store and we ran a store and we ran a business, that wouldn't be, that income would not be tax exempt. So not every single item in the list of revenues is tax exempt. So that's one thing. The tax exemption is one thing. The nonprofit status, they, you can have revenue in the matter that you're doing, in the, um, you know, subject matter that you're, that you're chartered to do. What's the matter of position on paying zakat on money or gold gifted to children? If a year has passed, is zakatable. His guardian has to pay zakat on it. His guardian must pay zakat on that. Uh, If it's gold jewelry, there's no zakat on jewelry. Gold, silver, diamonds, sapphire, whatever it is. There's no zakat on there's no zakat on on these fine gems either. Right? So you can own sapphire, you can own emeralds, you can have a whole bag of rubies. There's no zakat on that. Unless it's something you plan to hold on to and trade. If you're holding on to it because you just like it, there's no zakat on it. If you're holding on to it because one day you're going to sell it, then the day you sell it, you pay zakat on it. If you are you have it because you're constantly buying, selling these things, then you pay zakat on it, on its inventory now. And inventory, once a year, you pay your zakat on your inventory. And you subtract, you subtract the... Uh, another 100, 15, 624. MashaAllah. I mean, I said to get to 15.5, then I said, nah, I don't like to burden anybody. Let's just go nickel and dime it to 15.2. And now we're at 15.6. You see, sometimes you try to single to left, you homer to right. right? You know that saying? It's actually a true story. It's a true story where um, it's game seven in the ALDS, or no, ALCS, the American League Championship Series in baseball. British people don't know this, but in America we have a sport here called baseball, which is like cricket, but Americanized. And it's tied. At any next run for the Yankees, they win the whole thing. They go to World Series. So Joe Torre goes to 
Aaron Boone, who was just a regular player. He wasn't great or anything. And he says to him as he's about to go up to bat, he says, just try to single to right. You might homer to left, right? And that's exactly what happened, right? And he wins the game and he became famous. And he got traded next season for A-Rod. But uh, that's the concept. If you actually try to do something reasonable, sometimes you end up going further than you expect. Is it halal to eat chicken slaughtered by Ahlul Kitab in the Maliki Madhab? If you are certain that they are Ahlul Kitab and you are certain that they cut the neck, then you may eat it. Such as the Amish in Pennsylvania. The Amish are a part of a religious group called the Mennonites. Okay. The Mennonites. And they have very, st- the Mennonites are very, st- there, there's a gr- number of Mennonite groups. One of them is the Amish. The Mennonites are very, very conservative uh, people in terms of technology. So they still, they don't have communities the way we do. They still slaughter with the hand. They cook with the hand. All right. And we have another update. Now we're at 16-1. That's two people. Allah, how amazing is that? On two people. 16-1. May Allah bless you all and support you. This truly is a community-wide effort. Some of you want La Cocina hoodies. I'll tell you what. From here on, every few weeks or something, we're going to actually produce a new design. And we're going to sell it on the stream. But there's only one wrinkle here. U.S. only. Okay, because the shipping is too much to Canada. And you, I don't know why the shipping to Canada is any big deal when parts of the United States are further than Canada. Yeah, so I can, I can send to Cali. I can send to Maine. Maine is further than Detroit. I mean, sorry, than Ottawa, than Toronto, right? Maine is higher up than Toronto if, if, if my map is... Yeah, yeah. I was really thinking about when I was in Syria, like... Mm. You, you, when you go past the border into yep. Turkey, like you can drive maybe 20 minutes down. It's like a bustling city. Like people like... Turkey? You, yeah, yeah, in Turkey. Like 20 minutes from, you know, where we were in Syria. Yeah. And people like during Iftar time, we were there and the amount of food that's being wasted, the excessiveness, the hedonism that's going mm-hmm. on there. Like people will be eating like, you know... Uh, it's ridiculous. Whatever it's they absurd. Eat. They'll eat one bite in there, they'll throw it out. And I'm just thinking to myself, it, like imagine if this was the time of the Prophet sent him. 20 minutes down... Yeah. You have the Muslims, the Muslims, not the Kufa, the Muslims, right? They're throwing out so much food, wasting so much food. 20 minutes down, they could have traveled. Yeah. Their brother and sister starving and dying. SubhanAllah. They could have fed them, right? They're starving. 20 minutes down, imagine. That's it, 20 minutes? 20 minutes down. So someone could go take the leftovers off the restaurant plates. When you're done, don't throw it in the garbage, put it here. And they would eat it. They take one sip and this is like the waiter takes it away. 20 minutes down. Think that's about insane. the Muslims. That's disgusting. Because actually. of uh, the British that drew these fake lines yeah. for the Muslims. Yep. Now we have to. And we deal accepted with this. it. Yep. We accept it. And you can't pass that line. Who says I can't pass that line? We just made it up in our heads. This area right here, I would say by 2050, is going to be a good chunk is going to be Muslim because of this soup kitchen, inshallah ta'ala. By Allah's power and, by, by, and, by, and through the soup kitchen. Because uh, we're developing a lot of great relationships. Now, you won't believe this next initiative that we have. We got a corporate donation of 1,000 sneakers. We got a corporate donation. We're in the process of securing it. No. Corp- seek sneakers. <laughs> Vans and other sneakers. Right? So we're going to have a massive bonanza and organize it. You come in, you show up, you, you, we're going to put out like maybe 10 pairs at a time, 20 pairs at a time, and one person at a time. So it's no chaos, right? You pick the sneaker you want. And we'll have them in sizes. So all the size, five, six, seven. So we can have lines. We can do this outdoors, and we can have lines for all the sizes. And you get in line. We're going to need a lot of volunteers. I don't want chaos. We have a catalog. We have, you're going to go in, you're going to have 60 seconds to pick, less than that. You have 10 seconds to pick a pair of shoes, right? So the size 12 will be in one area, size 11, 10, 9, all the way down to one, right? Then we're going to play the Quran and some qasidas so they can hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Law and order. You're going to stand in line, okay? And then afterwards, somewhere else, we can have maybe a vendor. We bring in a vendor, 
we bring in someone to to bring some food so that there could be a, like a nice atmosphere to it but that's how it's going to be it's going to be a massive 1000 sneaker bonanza we need your drone for that do you guys saw the video you saw the video that was Sadikin with their drone there's a group in Texas called Sadikin they're the ones who provided that drone footage of La Cocina. I think we have a beautiful soup kitchen. And you know what else I want to get this 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 summer? Especially the summertime, this place is popping. Because it's got the vibe. Now it's summer, right? It's got your Mexican Andalusi vibe to it. I want to get a landscaper. I want a landscaper to properly, like, put the uh, pots up on the walls, grow the plants. We can take care of them after that, but they'll put it up themselves, right? I want there to be greener everywhere and really truly have that Mexican restaurant slash Andalusian Mediterranean vibe. It's a little bit of a merging of both. Yeah. You plan on opening up uh, different branches? Like the and the no, after we nail this down properly. Um, Omar, can you put up, open up another tab, keep this tab in case we'll go to it later. I want you to open up the YouTube video that we put up and then pause it, pause it at, um, go down. Yeah. They're they're right there. Yeah. Look at that. Keep going. Hit hit play. And so actually rewind a little bit. Look at that. There, There you go. Look at that shot. That's my favorite shot of the soup kitchen. Rewind a little bit more. Did. Yeah, play it. Uh, no, let, let it play. Look. And watch this. Look at that gorgeous. Stop right there. Keep that. Just keep it there. Keep that on the screen. Especially when the sun is on there. Look at how gorgeous that soup kitchen is, right? I want to go eat there. You know what we're going to do? We're going to start having the chefs on site, right? And maybe if we get good enough, we, we grow the vegetables on site too. So you're actually getting, you know, proper proper food. But I look at those uh, Sister Zainab did, you know, Sister Zainab was very good at gardening too. She's the one who pr- who provided those lush green plants. I'm debating, do I put more pots up or is that enough? Right? I'm debating it. I think this side right here, you see? Use your mouse? Yeah, that side? Yeah, we need more there. Hundred. Yeah, we need more there. Go to the Instagram, see what kind of commentary they have there. Question Q&A on Instagram. Hey, if you're on Instagram and you want to see the whole stream, uh, screen, go to YouTube slash Safina Society. Let's take this question from Sam St. F. Can I just give zakat to an Islamic organization when they take percentages of, from administration costs? The answer is that you are allowed to give zakat through a wakil something called a wakil, a representative, who will then distribute it to the poor. That representative, if he is a part-time or full-time worker, will take his salary from the zakat itself. That is halal for him. Okay? So let's take an example. An, an organ, A masjid gets $1 million of zakat a year. Yeah, go there. A masjid gets a million dollars of zakat a year. And the employee that works on that is full-time. And he gets $100,000 salary a year. Because let's say he has five kids. Then yes, that's halal. He can take it from the zakat. But the zakat should be going to the poor. Okay? Okay. It's not going to turn the lights on of the mosque. It's not going to um, pay for, you know, the janitor of the mosque. No, it's going to the zakah distributor. Okay, and it's going to the poor. Should you conceal if you are from Ahlul Bayt? You, you can take it on a case-by-case basis because some people may consider this to be showing off. So in Syria, they, they keep it to themselves, right? But in Yemen, it's quite common for people to say, uh, we're from lineage of so-and-so. From, in Egypt, it's pretty common. You say, oh, so-and-so, is from, we're from the lineage of so-and-so. 
But in Syria, they, they tend to keep it to themselves. And that may be from historical purposes because Ahlul Bayt sometimes was not always welcome in Syria. But Allah knows best. But it, you have to judge the people around you. Are they going to find this, what are you, some kind of snob? Now tell, so what do you want me to kiss your hand next time I talk to you? Like people may have that attitude, which is not the good attitude towards Ahlul Bayt. I'm just saying that may be their attitude. So that would be a reason why you conceal it. It's not concealing it, but you're not announcing it. But if people would say, oh, that's wonderful, I'd love that, then yeah, you can tell them. Said man, you're from Ahlul Bayt, right? No? Okay. Like most people in the city. If you read the Prophet Muhammad's name, can you think of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or do you have to speak it? If you're reading silently in your head, then you then it's in your head. If you're reading out loud, then you have to say it out loud. Mu'in Money says, how do I guide my parents to the correct aqidah? Maybe you can just put videos on and let them hear it in the background. Maybe put booklets on the table and hear it in the background or have a polite discussion with them. No problem. What should one do if there are sinus issues during the fast? If it is shadid, you break your fast, meaning it's very painful. But if it's just an aggravation, then you fight through it. And try to find solutions in suhoor, during suhoor. Um, there is a, a type of, uh, there is Neil Med. I don't know if you guys heard of Neil Med. Neil Med, it's, it's a guy named Dr. Neil, a Hindu guy, who invented this uh, technique. But it's very invasive. You put, it's a, it's a saline in warm water, and he's created this device. You actually push this device up your nose. The saline water goes into your sinuses and out the other nose. It's extremely painful. But he swears by it. Omar is showing us the back of the soup kitchen. This is where all our events happen. Look at this gorgeous back. We're right up here. That's where we are, right up there. That's right behind me, right here. What he's pointing to is right behind me, right up here. Yep, that's the window behind us. All right. And that beautiful patio right there is where you're going to see. This is what this is what we keep busy in the summer. Look at the kids running around, playing uh, a game there. Hey, Omar, can you go to the back end of the video, the back of the video, showing more of the kids playing around? Yeah, all that. All that. All that. Look at that. Look at these community events. And the, the, the NBIC community is the community that does, that's who you're seeing, who you're seeing cooking, donating the food. Our community, NBIC, New Brunswick Islamic Center. They're, they're, that's all New Brunswick Islamic Center people right there. All these Shabab, yeah. These are all Dar al students. Look at all these students from Dar al people from NBIC. Okay, there's, you see that brother with the long, luscious hair, mashallah? He's single. This brother's Habib single. is single with the sun. See the two the, the two guys? Yeah, those two guys are this, single. His brother's too young right now. Adif is still. Yeah, Give him a couple like more years. Months. Five more years. Five months. Okay. Zishan getting married next uh, week. This and ready. Islam is married already. He's ready. Yeah, Habib and Ali. Okay, Habib Ali. <laughs> All right, keep going. And these are some of the games that we play for the game. Let me pause it right there. Let me tell you something. Um, yeah, pause it right there. We started off this thing and say, you know, we need to help these day laborers. We want to give, we want to be, you know, a source of, of, of ease for them and all that. What we realized afterwards, though, is that when we had our opening barbecue, the kids were going crazy. And we realized, you know what? The summer's all, it's all kids from now on. The summer is all kids. And we had this year three events. I think next year we'll have more, right? Barbecues. We had, a, we had the first opening day barbecue. And I wanted to show the New Brunswick Islamic Center, the MBIC, the community, the leadership there, you know, uh, what this is all about. And someone came up with the brilliant idea of saying, why don't we have a barbecue for the whole New Brunswick community, so that way the the leadership of the masjid will be able to see with their own two eyes what's happening. And you won't have to say anything. You won't have to say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, right? 
I thought that's a brilliant idea. So we had this event. At this event, the moms, they came and brought all their kids and the kids just had a blast. They just don't have space where they live in New Brunswick. They don't have big spaces like this. They were running around playing games. Immediately a light bulb went off in my head. The next event we're going to do is going to be a kid's game day. And this is what's happening here. Like they line up. Red light, you have to stop. Green light, you have to go. You know this game. Then they played musical chairs, you know, with, with Islamic nasheeds on. Of course, so people don't think we're doing something haram. Then they we gave, had a cotton candy machine. Then a popcorn machine. I'm telling you they had a blast. There must have been 50 kids here that had never seen anything like this. They don't get free stuff. Uh, after that, what did we do? We did another one. What was it? Uh, we did a woman's day. A, a woman's event. All women came, and then the, the women from the MBIC community came, gave talks. One sister was Spanish-speaking, okay, gave talks just about Islam. Then they just ate, okay, and they, and they mingled and talked. Then the third event was the back-to-school event. So we that's when we put out a whole thing. Give us all your... It, it was an Amazon list, and you can basically pay for items. Pencils, erasers, trapper keepers, all those other things, right? You guys don't know what a trapper keeper is. I remember we had that debate. Remember that? Yeah. So all those things, calculators. And then we laid it out and very systematically, every kid got a bag, right? And then he could pick out clothes because there were some clothes, back to school clothes, right? Most people get all their, their clothes, you know, for back to school, but some of these kids can't afford that. That event was so massive, it was unbelievable. How many kids came out and families to take a bag of back-to-school supplies, right? So that's basically what we discovered. The summer, it's usually all about these kids. I think one of these kids, we're just going to, one of these days, we're going to get the water slide, you know, we get the water slide out. You know that water slide? You connect the hose to it, and it's like a plastic strip, and the kids just run and slide, Right? Question, my question is, is there enough space and what are they going to slide into, right? <laughs> slide, you know, there's there's a river behind us, by the way. I don't want them to slide woof, right off and into the river, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And we got the goat. I got the goat so the kids could like see an animal, farm animal. Of course, that one cop had to pretend he was some kind of hero. Okay. And, and he reported us. Okay. Yeah, I know. I wanted the kids to see like a, a farm animal, feel like there's a vibe here. But no, we have to... Rottweilers, okay, no problem. Pit bulls, no problem, okay? But this goat had to go. So keep, hit play, keep see if there's more footage now of these kids. Yeah, pause, pause it right there. Yeah, that's really good. Look at that wonderful picture. That is an amazing picture, by the way. Whoever took that photograph. Could that the lighting is amazing and it's it embodies exactly what we want because you can see the greenery there. You don't see greenery like that in other parts of New Brunswick. It's too crowded. Okay. Ever since Fedger comes in at 18 degrees, 20 minutes after the Adhan apps and many message message have time for Fedge, can one still pray to Hedjud? After the app says Fedra's in. If we believe in 18 degrees, let's believe in 18 degrees. If that's what we think is the correct answer, stick to the correct answer, right? And therefore, you can pray to Hedra before that and Fedra right after that. Can Safina be a child's name? Yes, male or female. And in this, the Prophet wasallam had a servant named Safina. Shake Rose, what do we do in the winter? In the winter, we have our events indoors, but it's mainly just the dinners. It's not the, the nice barbecues in the outside on the patio, outside. Uh, the, the Pixel Ninja says, community volunteers really are the sales of the Safina. That's totally true. The community volunteers. It's all come out comes out of the masjid. Now third space, no institute, 
plain old masjid, okay? Because that's where the foot traffic is. That's where people come in. Can we speak to, who can we speak to for marital problems? Well, we're about a month and a half away from launching our own platform for that, by the way. I've mentioned that many times before. Our own platform for marital support, marital coaching, marital counseling, right? It's professional operation though, right? Like that, yeah, same thing. But we're starting only with marital issues, before and after marriage, like premarital counseling. We're about to get married. Let me show you the ropes. It's not going to be me to do it. Others do it, and after marriage issues, and it's going to be a professional operation, right? Yeah. Yes, Nuri, the that what I described that cleans out the sinuses definitely breaks the fast. Don't do it while fasting. Do it after what afterwards. Okay. If you've a dream of a wali of Allah or a sheikh who's alive and you've never met him, it may mean that you're benefiting from that sheikh. That's what the meaning is. Do you do we Muslims believe in the curse of Ham on black people? No, there's there's no authoritative even in Judaism, it's not an it's not like a verse of the Bible. I think it's in the Talmud. It's a narration in the Talmud or something like that, which is non canonical. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's like this. Noah's on the ark, and of course his oldest son didn't believe and left. The next three boys were there that are Shem, Japheth, and Ham. Then while Prophet Noah was sleeping, allegedly, this is not a story we believe in, just telling you what the Israeliyat is. Okay. Wind came and blew his thobe up and his aura appeared. So Japheth turned away, Shem covered him really quickly, and Ham laughed. So Noah woke up to this scene and he looked at Shem who covered him up and he said, may Allah bless you. My prophecy will go to you next. Japheth, Allah bless you for turning away and you'll be the supporters of Ham. The prophecy will be with, with uh, Shem and the monarchy will be with Japheth. And as for you, may your lineage come out black, nappy-haired, and be the slaves of Japheth and, him, uh, uh, and Shem. That's the story in the Talmudic story. I believe it's in the Talmud, if I'm not mistaken. It's not a biblical verse. It's definitely not an Islamic story, and it's not anything we believe in. Now people say, oh, well, yeah, but it happened. How did it happen? Oh, because blacks were slaves. Yeah, but Albanians were slaves. Whites were slaves. In China... When they, whenever they conquered people, they took slaves. In the old world, everyone was a slave. When Muslims conquered Persians, they, they took Persian slaves. They didn't take just the... So, so yes, everyone was a slave at some point. At some point, when you have wars, you had slavery. That's how wars were handled back in the old days. So whites had... They were white slaves. Who is the first, the number one slave, and where does the word come from? The Slavs. The origin of the word comes from the ethnicity of the people because apparently I guess the Western Europeans took them as slaves or something like that. Who I don't know, but we could look it up. So, so just because Americans had black slaves and they were, you know, Christians and attributed themselves to Japheth. So the story, as the story goes, when the ark landed, Shem and his sons stayed around the Mediterranean and the, the Syria area. That's why it's called Shem. Uh, Ham went down and his kids came out black into in Africa. Japheth went up north and his kids came out Scandinavian looking. And Sham's kids stayed the same, which is a mix between brown, sometimes very dark brown, sometimes light, but not white, not so white like Scandinavians. In the middle between the, between the two. None of this is authoritative. None of this should be taken home. None of this has any action upon it. And in fact, we can outright dismiss it completely. Okay. 
Hafsa Salim saying a wall of vines on the La Cucina kitchen would be amazing. I totally agree. I mean, I think we need to do that. How are we? Huh? Sometimes vines are like, it can look like messy. Yeah. That's why it needs to be someone who's uh, taken care of professionally. So that's the answer for the North Korean survivor on do Muslims believe in the curse of Ham? No, we don't believe in it. How are we doing on uh, lunch? I spoke to a young man named Eric Curtis about Islam, and he has commented here, and he says, it was a pleasure speaking to you today. If I convert to Islam, will I be held accountable for the days of Ramadan that I missed as a non-Muslim? Number one, you will not be held accountable for what's in the past, no. And number two, the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he sent his companions to preach. He said, first tell them about Islam. If they accept it, then tell them about the prayer. When they pray, when they learn how to pray, then tell them about the fast. When they learn how to fast, then tell them about the charity, zakah. So when you become a Muslim, you're not expect, it's not expected of you to carry on every single obligation of Islam at once. Rather, you, you, you strengthen your belief first, so yes, you have belief, now you strengthen it. How? By reading more about the Prophet, more about Allah, the attributes of God, the, 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 the life of the Prophet, the nature of the afterlife. You focus on that first. So it's one thing, yes, I have absolute certainty, but now you strengthen that certainty, okay? By reading a lot and by listening, watch lectures, all about God, Prophet, angels, afterlife, heaven and hell. You strengthen your faith regarding that. You listen to the Quran a lot in the Arabic, even if you don't understand it. It strengthens your heart. After you become strong, you say, okay, now I'm ready to the next step, prayer. Some people right away, they learn, they take shahada, they want to take action right away, which is good. Action breeds faith. So the next thing you're going to focus on is the prayer. It's not reasonable or fathomable that you have to learn prayer and fasting all at the same time. No, we can't juggle by doing three balls at once. Do two first. Belief and prayer now. Prayer, you have to learn what is impure and remove it from your body before you pray. Then you learn have to learn how to make wudu. Then you have to learn the prayer times. Then you have to learn the prayer movements and what's to be said in the prayer. What nullifies the prayer? That may take you two months. I have a video on it. Okay, a video series. Could you put the link, please, Omar? And maybe even show the picture of the video series. Omar's working overtime today. Um... After that, you learn the fast. You learn how to fast after that, okay? And then l later on, now let's say you became Muslim on the 15th of Ramadan. And for the first 15 days, hey guys, I'm a brand new Muslim. I don't even know anything. So he didn't fast. We don't hold who be held sinful because the Prophet clearly said first, how to pray, then how to fast. Go to the playlist, the how to pray playlist. Click on that, no, the playlist itself. Yeah, yeah. click on the title on the right. Yeah, click on that. Oh, it's the same thing? Okay. So, yeah, you can see it all right there. How to pray. It's not reasonable or ex uh, uh, expectation, there you go, to say he's got to be praying fast or else you're sinful. How? It's practically not possible. Give the person a chance to learn how to pray. After he prays, you learn how to fast. Later on, when he becomes very strong in his religion, then he makes up those days. As one, not a kafara. Because there is a difference between I missed the fast, I have to make it up for a valid excuse. I have to make it up. And I blatantly broke the fast. Blatantly disrespected the month of Ramadan. When you blatantly break the month of Ramadan, then you owe a very heavy penalty. But when you're like, hold on, guys, I'm a new Muslim. I don't even know anything. I don't even know how to pray. So that person is not blatantly breaking the fast. Therefore, later on, when he becomes strong in Islam, he makes, makes his days up. Okay, makes up those days. So even I was listening to Mark Lamont Hill have a, had a very good podcast on Sean King becoming Muslim. And he said, uh, and he basically came to the same conclusion I did. But he also said that, hold on a second, he, Sean King became Muslim on the first on the eve of Ramadan, like the first night of Ramadan, that shows his commitment because now he has to fast the whole month. But that's not exactly true, right? Yes, it will be, it will be 
um, he is liable to fast those months, but he can make them up because he's a brand new Muslim. He does not even know how to pray. We have a new another convert here. It looks like Snoop Dogg's stepson or somebody. I don't know anything about these rappers. Click it. Show who this person is, and he accepted shahada. Um, I don't know anything about this rapper. Click the video. Let people let, put it next to me. Yeah, like that. This is actually good. You we YouTube it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep him firm upon the path of his obedience for the rest of his life. All right, Brother John, so to become a Muslim, you're going to take the testimony of faith, inshallah. So that means you're going to testify that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah alone without any partner. And you're going to testify that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the servant and the final messenger of Allah. Are you ready to do this, inshallah? All right, so we're going to say it in Arabic first, and you repeat after me, then we'll say it in English as well, all right? So repeat after me. Yeah. <laughs> all right, got it? Okay. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika Lahu, lahu, wa ashhadu, wa ashhadu, anna, anna, Muhammadan, Muhammadan, abduhu, abduhu, wa rasuluh, wa rasuluh. I testify. His Arabic is good. There is no one, there is no one worthy of worship, worthy of worship, except Allah, except Allah, alone, alone, without partner, without partner. And I testify, and I testify that Muhammad, that Muhammad is his servant. And final messenger. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Congratulations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you firm upon the path of his obedience. Congratulations, brother. Where is he from? LA, Los Angeles. That's the King Fahd Mosque in Los Angeles. And we're experiencing at this time in the uh, Muslim American scene. So it's maybe not mass, but it's like every day, five, two, uh, five, ten people. And very regularly, like highly visible people entering Islam. I mean, I don't know who this person is, but. Uh, I know that. Okay. You know, do you remember that really hit song? It was like, which one? Turn it down for what? No, no, I don't know that stuff. Know. Maybe if I heard it, yeah. And it's a big deal, huh? Ajib. Ajib. Excelsior asks a good question. If I have a disease where I smell very badly, can I? Am I exempt from praying in the mosque because people are upset at my smell? The answer is yes. That's discussed in the books. Uh, of when is someone exempt from Juma? Okay, so yes, you are exempt from Juma and from the other obligations in the mosques. What do you recommend reading with teenagers? I would read all the Sira books, the books of Imam al Haddad, the Remembrance of Death and Afterlife, the stories of all the prophets. I would read that with them. The Futuwa books, books are excellent. Futuwa, look up Futuwa. Futuwa is like, they love that stuff. yeah, to be like a, a noble, a nobleman, basically. What makes person noble character? Can I? Volunteer at the soup kitchen during Ramadan that feeds homeless people during the day. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And even if a Muslim shows up, you can assume he's traveling or sick. How do we combat the argument of the Prophet wasallam marrying Sayyidah Aisha and she was six years old? Okay, but this is what's stopping them. You say, look, who knows best, God or you? If Allah, if the Creator ordains something, it's good. Simple as that. Our level of disgust means nothing, right? Our sentiments about something don't mean anything. So if you believe in God, but, oh yes, I believe in God, but okay, God can do this. Simple as that, right? You believe in hellfire, right? Isn't hellfire really bad, right? So you accept that. So Allah Ta'ala has, has ordained things that are beyond our sentiments. 
So Allah first, our sentiment second. And if Allah tells you, there's a verse in Quran that says, if Allah told you to kill yourself, it would be good for you. The moment God says something, it becomes good. It was bad before, it becomes good now. And the moment he forbids something, it becomes bad. Moses married two sisters. Allah came in the Quran and forbade that. It became bad. It was good, it became bad. Just like that. It was something people look at as wholesome, now people look at it with disgust. The first generation, how about this sister? The first generation, Adam and Eve's kids, how did they marry? They married each other, right? You were born with a, with a twin, male and female. Eve had 20 pregnancies. In each pregnancy was a male and a female. Okay. A male and a female. You couldn't marry your twin. You, and Adam would arrange the marriages. And I, I don't know how they went. But Adam is the wali of all the women, right? Anyway, in the first place. You had to take his permission to marry one of your sisters, and you married her. And that man felt attracted to that woman. He felt, But he didn't feel attracted to his twin. He disgusted from the concept, right? Just like you can have an attractive relative, let's say a daughter, a niece, an aunt, and you could admit that she's attractive, but you have no feeling towards her. That's Allah created you like that, right? Think about that. It's amazing. Allah just created you. There is no sexual desire at all for this person. Never will happen, even though if they're the most attractive person. This is if your fitrah, your nat natural creation is still intact. Right? Just by virtue of that. So likewise, they were disgusted by their twin. They would never come near their twin. But they could marry their other sibling. Okay? And then, Abel... And Cain had the fallout, and that reduced the number of men to what? To 19 men now. So there's 20 women and 19 men. So that's a problem now. So what happened? Hawa had the last and final baby, and that was who? The prophet Seth. Sheath. So Sheath was born alone, and he was a prophet. Not by Ijma. Ijma is complete consensus. It's not by Ijma that he was a prophet. And Sheath completed the number of males. 20 males, 20 females. You can't marry your twin. You have an option of 19 other women to marry. It's actually interesting, like, uh, that point about how, like, the Quran has so many things, like, uh, like about torture, for example. Yeah. Which is a lot, like, if you look at it from the, you know, the moral paradigms that these people operate on, that should be way worse, right, than uh, the marriage of Aisha radhi Yeah. But what it really shows is uh, it's, it's, it's just outlining their philosophy, which is the idea of consent being like above anything. Exactly. I mean, yeah. What is consent representative? It's representing the human freedom. Yeah. So Humanism. They have an issue with that because they think, oh, she couldn't consent. But then they don't have an issue with like hellfire and people being tortured and, yeah. and killed. But then again, in first grade, you can consent these days to being a guy if you're a girl. And, you can, and, and, you can, and they, they have to respect it, right? But wait, she can't marry? But you can, like, the point is, like, you can trace all this back. Yeah. It's interesting to think about uh, yeah. how everything adds up. Can I, can I be thankful for something if I'm not sure it is halal? Well, it depends if there's action upon it, for example. For example, if I get money in the mail, someone leaves me a wad of cash in the mail, that's halal for me to take. It's a gift from an anonymous source, right? I don't have to say, oh, maybe it was drug money. Maybe someone's get rid of, getting rid of money, right? We don't know that, right? If I inherit money from somebody, I don't have to ask what your job was. If it's food, I have to be sure that it's halal before I eat it. I can't. If someone puts a hamburger in my in my mailbox and say, or in front of my door and say I, I, it's an anonymous gift, I, I'm not eating it unless it says you know halal restaurant on it. Even that's probably dubious. If a woman dreams of taking the hand of a sheikh, can it be a true dream? What sharia apply? Should I take bayah with that sheikh? I can't tell you uh, to do that or not. But you can investigate with your worldly, your wakeful state 
apparatus that you possess, your hands, you, I mean, your, your ability to read, to listen, to examine, to ask, and make a decision that way, whether you want to follow that scholar or not. Adam N70 is saying that the ham story is an interpretation of the Old Testament. So it's not even the Bible itself. Okay. What is the proof? What level of proof is necessary to prove you're from Ahlul Bayt? Are there benefits in being from Ahlul Bayt? Okay. As a convert who married in. Yes. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that on the day of judgment, he will intercede. Everyone will want to intercede for his family, and he will too. So he'll intercede for his family and those who married into his family. As long as they died upon Islam. The same people that were throwing shade at Andrew Tate's conversion are the same people throwing shade at Sean King. Okay, and he said basically the feminists. Wait, feminists? I thought they would like Sean King. Yeah, because he's more on the left side, leaning side. Now, hopefully, there'd be none of that. It could be left leaning a little, right leaning a little, but within the Sharia, within Islam, that's all fine and good. I mean, any, anyone in the activist world is going to attract left leaning uh, crowds. Yeah. But why are some of the activist crowd attacking Sean King? See, I don't know the yeah, politics know behind it. If I'm in a state of impurity and I wake up after Fajr, can I fast? Yes. Let's say a man has a wet dream or he sleeps with his wife and he doesn't take a ghusl. He's in a state of ritual impurity. It has nothing to do with fasting. You continue to fast. You have suhoor even. You have your pre, pre-dawn meal. Then the adhan of Fajr goes off. Then you go take a shower. No problem. And you owe nothing. Amir Sill. You skipped my question. Okay, let's go back to Amir Sill. And let's take, that'll be, we'll wind down at that. We had a great stream today, mashallah. We had a nice interview. We talked about some fiqh of niqab. We read some fiqh. Okay. This can't be the last question. Amir Sill says, I'm scared to recite the word talaq. In the Quran, because I'm afraid I will divorce my wife, is this wiswas? Yes, it's wiswas. If the word talaq comes in a book, or you're giving an example, has nothing to do with talaq. Talaq counts if you actually tell your wife, I've divorced you. Is there a dawra in tarim this year? I believe there's a dawra every year now in the summer and the winter too. If you die without ghusl, is it a sin? It's not a sin, no. Let's say a man, he um, needed to take a ghusl, a shower, full body wash, which is taken after sexual intercourse or release of semen or even just intercourse without climaxing. All that requires ghusl. Requires it. Otherwise you can't pray and you can't enter a mosque. So a person dies before taking a ghusl. That doesn't mean he's cursed. It doesn't mean he's um, sinful or nothing like that. But it's oh, it's not good to delay the ghusl for no reason. What about praying sedl? Uh, just go to safinasidi.org slash sedl, S-A-D-L, and I give you all the proofs. All the imams, all the schools of thought have clasping the hands in the prayer and praying with the arms down but they have it at different levels the three schools hold it as the prayer is valid with the arms down and you're missing a minor virtue in the Madiki school the arms down is the sunnah in the obligatory prayer and clasping the hands is permissible in the recommended prayer that's it it's not even a big deal it's a big deal because it's so visible but as a matter of scholarship, it's literally a non-issue. There's not a single madhab that says your prayer is invalid based on how you hold your hands, up or down. None of them. When someone converts to Islam, should they take a ghusl? Yes, they should. As a rec- it doesn't, It's not connected to their conversion, though. This is the important point. Someone who entered Islam... Now, previously, they had had a wet dream or something. They were or menstruation or they were mature, basically, in something that would have required a full body wash. 
So they have to go do that now. However, it's not like a condition of their entering Islam. You enter Islam, right? As soon as you can, you take a full body wash. That purifies you from the state of Janaba that you were in from before. I actually have a question. Like, yeah. How do you, because I remember one time uh, one of the brothers, he, can, he took a shahada. Mm -hmm. And the way we ordered it was like, Oh, um, you know, go home, pray to God for guidance. And he took a shahada. We were saying, you know, yeah. thank God for guidance. And uh, what we want you to do is go take a bath to purify yourself. Like we just worded it in that so way. So the we, poor poor guy went and, and, and filled the tub? No, like go take a shower. Like Yeah, shower. Bath. That's enough. Like not bath, but shower yeah, or something. A shower, like, I see. Okay. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, like that's that. good enough. And uh, just to kind of kind of get him to yeah. take a listen without telling him, like, you have to take a listen. It's oh, you do need to tell him it's an intention. With the intention of purifying yourself. Not in the Hanif school. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Wait, the Nia, oh, no, the you're Nia right. You're right. Okay. He got me on that one. He said not in the Hanafi school. <laughs> the Nia of the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So he's in, I guess, from Allah. Mm -hmm. Khalas. He's Muhtasar. That's it. He's But like, he's is tahir. that the best way to do it? Or is there a better way to get them to do this? And like? I mean, it's, is, you think it's hard? Because he's just taking a, a shower. No, I'm saying like, getting him to take the shower. Like, you tell him it's an obligation. You got to go take a shower. You just change this whole religion. The yeah. shower is the easy part, right? Yeah. I would just tell you, yeah, you go take, go home, take when you get home, take a shower. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Take a full shower, and you could say nice words like, "Oh, it symbolizes your new beginning and all that," and also it purifies you yeah, from the past. Yeah. See, Subhanallah, he's thinking in the Hanafi mentality that the intention is not needed for for wudu and ghusl, and that that skipped my mind. Is it necessary to pray one third or half the night for it to count as qiyam al layl? No, not at all. Any amount of rakas is enough. If someone missed Allah because they forgot and they fell asleep, is it sinful to not make it up as immediately as you remember? Yes, delaying it beyond what is. Um, delaying it beyond. For, for no reason, yeah, it becomes you enter into discouragement and even sinfulness. But delaying it for a valid reason, that's, uh, uh, inshallah, will not be sinful. And Nafi, Nafi is, here, is Nafi is here saying, there we go with the beyond the river again. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Do the Medici have to rub the body in ghusl? Yes, you have to rub your body, not just pour water. How is it that Moroccan and Algerian women used to wear face veils? Yeah, it, it's mentioned. We just actually read it. Iddardir it, uh, it mentioned it. He mentioned out in Morocco and Algeria, there's a custom of women, they all cover their faces. Where did the custom from? How did it come from? Was it religious? Allah Adam, it doesn't matter. But the answer is that, the answer for that is that covering the face is if it's a custom of the people, it's permitted. And it was a custom of the people. Even in Europe, queens never came out without a face fail. Okay? Princess never came out without a face fail. So, yeah, then she can wear it. But if she's doing it, believing it's a necessity in religion, then that's ghulu fid din. Not acceptable. And discouraged. We're not even going to say sinful. Just discouraged. Bid'a makruha. Okay. Last question. Are Naqshbandiya Qadiriya on Orthodox are they Orthodox tariqas? There's so many branches you have to assess the actual scholar that you're planning to be under. And be very careful with this. Where do you get miswak in New Brunswick? Probably any of the halal stores on Route 27. Go to Route 27. Keep going. You head into from North Brunswick to to South to Franklin Park to South Brunswick to Kendall Park. All there's a lot of halal stores. They all should have miswak. Okay. Is cryptocurrency halal? It depends on which currency, and it depends if um, it really depends because um, there have been scams before. Like who? So in that in the sense that if you don't know what you're getting, you're not allowed to go into that business. 
What, what was that guy called? NTF or whatever. Oh, that was his crypto. Yeah. What was his, what was his cryptocurrency called? Yeah. yeah. Bank Shimer or something like that. Yeah. Any advice for people who are diabetic and can't fast to gain spiritual benefits of Ramadan? Yeah. Do the things that fasting people can't do, like help serve the iftar, help prepare the iftar, things like that. Help do the things that fasting people can't do. What if he had a dream, but the prophet looked a little different than how he's described? That just means that the dreamer himself is not perfected in his vision. And Allah knows best. Yep, I just answered that one. My grandmother used to cover her face just last 15 years ago in Morocco. Allah bless her soul. Yeah, it was the Ada in all Morocco, or probably all of Egypt, everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, we will stop here. Jazakumullah khair. Let's get to the final count of how we did on launch. The final count for the day. This is launchgood.com slash Safi Insider. Hmm. Just stick it in the bar. There you go. All right, final count for the day, 16 to 22. Pretty good. A, a very good day. It's not a lot more than we expected. I wanted to get to 15 two, right? We got to 16 two. See that? I wanted to get to 15 two. We got to 16 two. And that is all the reward of these attendees. May Allah Ta'ala bless you, increase your wealth, and increase, all, accept all of our siyam and our qiyam and our dua. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu aminu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Jesus.